morning. Thank you all for joining us. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Uh, we want to take a moment to say thank you, all of you, for uh, joining us. Uh, before we get into some opening remarks in our first panel, we want to be able to say thank you to Humboldt State for allowing us to be here. And uh, let's give HSU a round of applause and say thank you so much. We want to say thank you to all of our panelists who have traveled far and wide to be able to join us today. We want to say thank you to the gentleman to my right, Tom Westlow, who is the chief consultant for the Joint Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture. A round of applause for Mr. Westlow, please. And on behalf of the Joint Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture, we welcome you to our hearing on fisheries in offshore wind development. Uh, my name is Mike McGuire, and I'm honored to be able to be the chair of the Joint Committee, and I really do appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be able to be here today. We are bringing out some additional chairs. We have a full house, uh, and we're grateful for that. And we welcome you to the edge of the Humboldt Bay and those who are watching our streaming broadcast to hear about California's burgeoning Pacific offshore wind industry and how it's emerging as a critical component of our fight against climate change. And while this industry will be an important source of power in the Golden State's energy portfolio, it's equally important, I think that we can all agree, equally important to protect the Golden State's fishery and wildlife resources where offshore wind turbines would be located. Our focus today, being the Joint Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture, is simple. California needs to ensure this new green energy source does not harm our fisheries, wildlife, and the local economy that depends on a thriving natural resource. And as you all know, California has been a leader in this nation by establishing an ambitious, a bold goal of relying entirely on zero emission energy for its electricity by 2045. Governor Jerry Brown signed a Senator De Leon bill mandating the electricity target in early September of 2018. He also issued an executive order calling for a statewide, a statewide carbon neutrality, meaning California removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it emits by 2045. The law specifically requires that 50% of the Golden State's electricity to be powered by renewable sources by 2025. 60% by 2030, while calling for a bold path forward, 100% zero carbon electricity by 2045. And I think that most of us in this room, I know I do, support this initiative. And we want to acknowledge the hard work of the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Uh, RCEA has been advancing uh, and have been statewide leaders focused on offshore wind. We have some commissioners who are here today, and we want to acknowledge them and say thank you for all of their work. And we also need to expedite the work of the task force that was created by the federal and state governments to put meat on the bone when it comes to rules and regulations to protect fishing grounds and our coastal environment where turbines would be located. In many cases, turbines would be placed uh, where there are high winds, those high wind zones also coincide with upwelled waters. These waters have high levels of nutrients, which mean there are high levels of food sources, which means there are robust fisheries and marine life in the same locations where potential turbines would be located. We also need rules and regulations where the large electric connector cables connecting the turbines with the grid would be laid out on the sea floor and address the ongoing maintenance and operations that would potentially impact fishing grounds, and sensitive ocean habitat. California has to get this right. We will get this right, and it's time to involve the stakeholders on a statewide regulatory process. And you're going to hear from the CEC, as well as BOLM, that they have launched a series of community hearings up and down this state. For us today, we need to be able to start putting that meat under the bone. Our number one goal of today's hearing is to hear from all of you and to start formalizing the regulatory process. We have an all-star lineup of panelists, and I'm so appreciative that they all made it out here today. And we're going to ask each of our panelists to be able to keep it within our five-minute testimony window. We have a pretty tight window here today, as there is another meeting coming in this afternoon that we're going to have to be able to make room for. We'd like to be able to introduce at this time some of the dignitaries who are here today and thank them for joining us. 
From, this, from the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors, we have Supervisor Fennell and Wilson. If we could please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, Supervisors, for being here. From the Arcata City Council, we have Council Member Winkler here today. Thank you so much, Mr. Winkler, for joining us. Representing uh, Del Norte County, ladies and gentlemen, we have a Harbor Commissioner here. Thank you so much to Commissioner Brian Stone, who is here today. Thank you so much, Mr. Stone. From the Ferndale City Council, we have Council Member O'Rourke. Thank you so much for joining us. From the Humble Bay Harbor and Recreation District, we have uh, Mr. Coleman here today. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to take a moment to say thank you to the hard work of Congressman Jared Huffman. He is one hell of an advocate for the North Coast, and he is lucky to be able to have Ms. Emery and Mr. Driscoll working on his behalf here on the North Coast, and we want to welcome both of them to the meeting today. Thank you so much. Speaking of hardworking advocates, we are so grateful that Assemblymember Wood has been our partner 100% of the way on this important issue. And representing Assemblymember Wood here today, we have Aaron Dunn. Welcome, Aaron. Also from the Humboldt Bay Harbor and Recreation District, we're well, we would like to be able to welcome Mr. Richard Marks to the meeting. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, representing the McKinleyville Community Service District, we have Mr. Mayo here today. Thank you so much, Dennis, for joining us. So everyone should have received an agenda, and I'd like to be able to briefly go over the agenda and then get straight into our first panel. Our first panel, made up of individual agency representatives. We're grateful that uh, we are going to have BOEM here today. We have the California Energy Commission, the California Natural Resource Agency, as well as the California Coastal Commission represented on our agency panel, focusing on all issues of offshore wind. Our second panel is going to be focusing on mitigating potential environmental impacts, um, as well as uh, hearing from the industry itself. We're going to be having the, we have Principal Power here today. We have Humboldt State who will be uh, focusing on the local projects. And we have representatives from the American Wind Energy Association. Coming up on our third panel, we do have environmental leaders uh, from the Redwood region of the Audubon Society, Surfrider Foundation, and of course the Natural Resources Defense Council. We will then round out the hearing, hearing uh, from Humboldt Fisheries, the fishermen and the fleet. We'll have representatives from the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association, the Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association, as well as the Executive Director from Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. This is a well-rounded hearing, trying to be able to provide equal time for a diverse set of voices. And of course, we're going to open up the microphone to all of you under public comment. Again, thank you for joining us. And now we'd like to be able to introduce our first speaker here today on our first panel. She is the Chief Renewable Energy uh, Pacific Region uh, Officer from the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management. We're very grateful that Ms. Sumite is here today. Ms. Sumite, thank you so much for coming up to the hearing. We're happy that you're here. She's going to be providing us an overview of the federal perspective, and then we'll go to Ms. Wynn providing us with a state perspective. Without further ado, let's open up our first panel. You have five minutes, and I'll give you a 30-second pump. Welcome. And if you don't mind just hitting your uh, button and we're looking for the green button, you're on. Yes. Good morning. Um, thank you, Senator McGuire. Um, I'm pleased to appear before you today to discuss the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM for short, um, our wind energy planning process and our current status. So my name is Nessie Sumait, and I am the chief of the renewable energy section for BOEM specific region covering California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii. In recognition of the role renewable energy can play in securing the nation's energy independence and supporting economic growth, BOEM has been working to advance renewable energy through an expanded and targeted leasing program on both the Atlantic and Pacific Coast. To date, BOEM has conducted eight competitive wind energy lease sales for areas offshore the Atlantic coast, consisting of 15 active commercial wind energy leases, offshore Delaware, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Rhode Island, and Virginia. If fully developed, these leases could generate more en enough energy to power about 6.5 million homes. BOEM's in the planning stages to identify additional potential lease areas offshore California, Hawaii, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, and South Carolina. The potential demand for offshore wind energy on the Pacific Coast has never been greater. 
with California's target of 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. So pursuant to a memorandum of understanding with the state and establishment of a BOEM, California Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force, at the request of former Governor Jerry Brown, BOEM has been working with the state of California, industry, and other ocean users since October of 2016 to help to identify areas that may be suitable for future offshore wind development. BOEM's renewable energy leasing strategy is founded on a process that requires extensive planning and analysis, partnerships with states, stakeholders, and other governmental agencies. BOEM's renewable energy program occurs in four distinct phases. We have a planning and analysis phase, leasing, site assessment, and construction and operations. In California, we're at the early phase of the process in the planning and analysis phase. During this phase, we seek to identify suitable areas for wind energy leasing consideration through collaborative, consultative, and analytical processes that engage stakeholders, tribes, and state and federal agencies. BOEM recently issued a call for information and nomination on October 19, 2018, on three call areas, one on the North Coast and two on the Central Coast. We received over 100 comments and 14 companies submitted nominations of interest in leasing for all three call areas. The comments and nominations received are now posted on the BOEM website. So the next stage of our process is called area identification. BOEM will use the information it received in the call to inform our decision to offer all or part of the call area for commercial wind leasing. BOEM will identify wind energy areas if we determine that there, there are areas appropriate for leasing consideration. BOEM will then initiate a formal environmental review of these areas under the National Environment Policy Act for potential lease issuance. So throughout the entire process, including early planning, leasing, and then review of lessee plans, BOEM strives to engage stakeholders who might be impacted by potential activity, including fishermen. This outreach and interaction is conducted through meetings, workshops, soliciting stakeholders, input into project siting, best management practices, and research and monitoring measures. BOEM, in partnership with the state led by the California Energy Commission and the California Ocean Protection Council, convened a series of meetings during 2017 and 2018. During this outreach, approximately 80 meetings were held with numerous stakeholders including 18 meetings with fishers and fishing organizations in Crescent City, Eureka, Morro Bay, Port St. Louis, Santa Barbara, Sacramento, and San Clemente. Primary concerns identified by the fishing community were potential loss of fishing grounds, gear entanglement, mitigation measures used by the offshore wind industry, and loss of income. The results of this outreach are included in the Offshore Wind Energy Planning Outreach Summary Report that is also available on BOEM's website, and they were considered during the development of the three call areas. Going forward, we will use the feedback we received from the call and other data gathered to compile and analyze the available fisheries information to generate a spatial depiction of important harvest areas offshore the north and central coast regions. Data that will be included in this analysis include fishing vessel tracks, commercial and recreational landings, logbook data, and ethnographic information specific to potential impacts on fishing. When a lease area is identified and awarded to a company, BOEM may include appropriate measures to address fisheries and wildlife concerns in the lease instrument. For example, in the Atlantic BOEM has required lessees to develop a fisheries communications plan for use in communicating with fisheries stakeholders. BOEM also develops and funds and manages scientific research to inform assessments and provide a foundation for sound science-based policy decisions that help BOEM manage offshore energy in an environmentally and economically responsible manner. To this end, BOEM continues to work with its partners and stakeholders to further refine its initial analysis so that all potential impacts, both positive and negative, may be understood. Completed and ongoing studies informing renewable energy offshore 
California are also posted on our website. So thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Links to several documents have been related to the BOEM process and the California activities have been provided to committee staff and I believe that they will be posted on the committee's website to provide additional background. Um, as always, BOEM is glad to provide any additional information that the committee may request. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to hold questions until the end uh, for our entire panel to be able to speak. We now would like to better turn it over to Ms. Wynn, representing the California Energy Commission, to be able to give us a first-hand look of the agency who is partnering, the state agency, who is partnering with the federal agency. Ms. Wynn, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair McGuire. Thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to participate. My name is LaQuinn Wynn. I'm a policy advisor for Commissioner Karen Douglas at the California Energy Commission. The Energy Commission is California's primary energy policy and planning agency. We work closely with state and federal agencies, utilities, and other stakeholders to develop and implement state energy policies. California has a long history of strong leadership and ambitious initiatives to fight climate change and promote clean energy. We've set high goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, calling for a reduction to 1990 levels by 2020, 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, and 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. One of California's core strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions is our Renewables Portfolio Standard, which sets targets for the percent of energy sold to customers that must come from renewable energy. The initial target was 20% by 2017, but it has increased several times and is now at 50% by 2026 and 60% by 2030. As you mentioned earlier, in addition to these targets, California also has a goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2045. So we are on track to meet our energy and climate goals. In 2016, we met our greenhouse gas emission reduction goal for 2020, and renewable energy currently serves 32% of our energy demand. Over the last 10 or more years, the Energy Commission ha has had an active role in planning for different renewable energy technologies in different parts of the state. Some examples of these planning efforts that we've been involved in are the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan and the San Joaquin Valley Least Conflict Solar Project. The Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan is a landscape scale planning effort that conserves and manages plant and wildlife communities in the desert regions of California while facilitating the timely permitting of compatible renewable energy projects. The San Joaquin Valley Least Conflict Solar Project was a stakeholder-led process that helped identify more than 430,000 acres of land most appropriate for solar PV development in the San Joaquin Valley and analyze the transmission capacity available to bring, to bring PV generation onto the existing grid. Both of these planning efforts were highly collaborative and data-driven. They emphasize public outreach and engagement throughout those planning processes. It's important when looking at complex levels of planning efforts to coordinate with all of the agencies who will have a role in those efforts. Our planning efforts have involved us working closely with both state and federal agencies. In past efforts, we've, we've worked closely with the Bureau of Land Management and the Department of Defense, and now we're working closely with BOEM on planning for offshore wind in California. The Energy Commission has taken a lead role in coordinating the state's participation in the task force. In this coordination role, we work closely with state and local agencies, such as the Ocean Protection Council, the California Coastal Commission, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the California Public Utilities Commission, and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. The task force has been active for almost three years. During that time, our priorities have been to better understand the potential and constraints around offshore wind, stakeholder outreach and engagement, information and data gathering, and to identify research opportunities. As Bo mentioned, with our state and federal agency partners, we've held over 80 outreach meetings and webinars. And on the North Coast alone, we've held meetings in Eureka, Crescent City, Trinidad, and Blue Lake with stakeholders such as the fishing community, environmental NGOs, the Native American tribes, and the public. Last year, we also held an integrated energy policy report workshop in Arcata to hear about and discuss the North Coast's regional challenges, opportunities, and solutions to meet California's climate and clean energy goals. The offshore wind resource along the North Coast is some of the best in the world. Transmission is one challenge that exists in the North Coast. However, the potential call area for the North, North Coast is size for local need, avoiding some of those transmission constraints. Offshore wind has real potential to support our climate and renewable energy goals. It has a generation profile that complements solar, it can utilize existing onshore transmission infrastructure, and it promotes clean jobs and investment. 
Given the potential value of the renewable resource and the importance of the ocean and coastal environment to Californians and the local communities, we believe that it is important to continue improving our understanding of the potential and constraints around offshore wind through our planning efforts and continued outreach and engagement to stakeholders. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have for the panel at the end. Thank you so much, Ms. Wynn. Very grateful that you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, we now like to better turn the hearing over to Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter is a program manager uh, and is uh, overseeing marine renewable energy. He's with the Ocean Protection Council. So we've heard with the CEC, who works directly on all issues with uh, BOEM. Now, Mr. Potter, and then we're also going to hear from uh, Dr. Hucklebridge, who will be focusing on impacts, potential impacts on the ground and what could be mitigated and or avoided. So we're going to turn the floor over now to Mr. Potter, representing the Ocean Protection Council. The floor is yours. Thank you, Senator McGuire, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony today. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so the OPC, or the Ocean Protection Council, is a cabinet-level state agency that is charged with protecting, conserving, and maintaining California's ocean and marine resources for the benefit of current and future generations. We work at the intersection of science, policy, and management in four ways, breaking down <laughs> silos and coordinating efforts with partners inside and outside of government, ensuring best available science informs policy and management decisions, recommending actions to the governor and the legislature to protect ocean and coastal ecosystems, and finally, finding catalytic and innovative uh, projects to advance scientific understanding and improving ocean health. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so the OPC has a long history of working on marine renewable energy issues. In 2006, it established a state federal marine renewable energy working group to address the uncertainties in the regulatory process and the information needs of agencies and stakeholders. In December 2011, the OPC adopted a resolution specifically addressing marine renewable energy. Among other things, the resolution acknowledged that wave, tidal, and offshore wind energy may help California meet its long-term energy and carbon reduction goals, create new jobs, diversify the state's energy supplies, and reduce air pollution from fossil fuel power generation. In addition, it directs the OPC to work with the California Energy Commission on marine renewable energy policy development and issues. The OPC worked with the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Energy Commission in launching the Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force in 2016. Under the auspices of the task force, over the last two and a half years, we've helped plan and conduct outreach to the public, fishermen, tribes, environmental groups, and other stakeholders to share information and to have discussions around potential offshore wind energy development on the north and central coasts. We're planning additional North Coast outreach to fishing communities later this year and early 2020. The OPC wants to ensure that marine renewable energy projects minimize impacts to the coastal and marine environment and the state agencies have sufficient information to, and data to carry out their planning and regulatory responsibilities relative to marine renewable energy development. Consequently, we're funding studies at UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley, Humboldt State University, that investigate the range of potential impacts to the marine, coastal, and terrestrial environments that would result from marine renewable energy development. The development of these studies, study concepts, has resulted from close consultation with state and federal agencies, research institutions, and stakeholders. Currently, we're working with, very closely with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Energy Commission, Coast Commission, BOEM and Humboldt State in developing a study that will investigate the potential impact of fishermen from offshore wind development on the north and central coasts. The OPC strategic plan for 2019-2024 includes an objective to minimize impacts to the coastal and marine environment, recreation, and fishing communities resulting from marine renewable energy development. Attached to this objective are four actions. Number one, collaborate with research institutions to develop and fund studies and projects that investigate the environmental impacts of deploying and operating marine renewable energy technologies. <coughs> Two, collaborate with BOEM and the Energy Commission on priorities and operation of the Intergovernmental Task Force. Three, continue 
convening the California Marine Renewable Energy Working Group, and four, provide information to stakeholders on the permitting process for marine renewable projects through workshops, legislative hearings, webinars, and written materials. As the boom leasing process for offshore wind development on the north and central coasts rolls out over the next several years, the OPC will continue to look for opportunities to engage in scientific research, outreach, marine renewable energy planning, and policy development. Uh, last slide. So this is my contact information. I would encourage folks to contact me either way I, I, and uh, to, so we can just discuss what's on their mind. I really appreciate this opportunity to provide testimony today. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Potter, thank you so much for joining us. We're grateful you're here. We'll have some questions uh, after we hear from Dr. Huck Bridge. She's a senior environmental scientist with the California Coastal Commission. We appreciate your presence here today. The floor is yours. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. If I could get my presentation up here. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, again, my name is Kate Hucklebridge. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the California Coastal Commission. Um, and if you could just skip to the second slide, <clears throat> um, and I'll just continue talking until they show up. Um, so as pro most of you are probably aware, the California Coastal Commission is charged with regulating development in the coastal zone to ensure the protection of coastal resources as required by the Coastal Act. Now, the Coastal Act, when we're thinking about offshore wind, the Coastal Act has a couple key policies that we'll be focused on as we review um, offshore wind development um, offshore of California. And those first two policies I want to talk to, I think, really align closely with the goals in charge of this committee, so I want to highlight those. The first is the protection of marine resources, which includes species, habitats, and water quality. And the second is the protection of fishing, which includes both recreational and commercial fishing. In addition to those policies, the Coastal Act includes uh, pr policies protecting public access and recreation, uh, minim minimization of impacts to navigation and hazards, um, protection of coastal public views, and protection of tribal and cultural resources. Next slide, please. So these projects, offshore and projects, are incredibly complex, and they um, span a wide, you know, a ge wide geographic area and th go through many jurisdictions. So I created this very crude um, diagram just to kind of walk through it. So as we've been talking about in California, we're really contemplating offshore wind turbines out in federal waters, and that's really the purview of the federal government through BOEM. Those, the power from those turbines will be connected through cables that go through both federal waters, through state waters, and then will connect on shore. Once they reach on shore, they will connect into our existing grid. Um, now, as part of an overall offshore wind project, there may be components onshore, such as upgrades to our transmission system or upgrades at the port to facilitate construction of wind turbines. And that's all part of the, the picture here. Now, the Coastal Commission is unique, I think, I think among federal and state agencies in that we um, have a regulatory role in all of these areas. So out in federal waters, we have federal consistency authority, and we'll be reviewing offshore wind at two different points, one prior to the lease sale, and one as we get farther down the line and we're looking at project-specific proposals. In state waters, the commission has direct permitting authority, so we'll, we will be providing a coastal development permit for any cables that need to be installed. Onshore, uh, depending on where the connection or the developments that, that is proposed occurs, the commission either has direct permitting authority or in the case where a local government or a port has permit authority under the Coastal Act, most of those projects as energy projects are then appealable to the Coastal Commission. Um, so the Coastal Commission will be reviewing these projects in their entirety in some way, and I think that's important to point out. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what are we doing to address um, impacts to California's fisheries and wildlife? Um, and the first thing I sort of want to point out there is our, is our general approach. Uh, the goal is to avoid impacts as much as possible. Um, if, they, if impacts can't be avoided, we want to minimize and then fully mitigate those impacts. And I just I want to make that really clear. The way that that's accomplished now in the planning process is to site lease areas and eventual projects in locations that accomplish those goals. Um, and that's really what we're, we're working on. The mitigation discussion is critical, but we're not there yet. We're still working on the try to avoid and minimize impacts. Uh, we'll get to mitigation a little bit further down the line, at least the specifics of what that might look like. So 
I'm not going to go into too much detail on the activities going on because you've heard that from the other panelists, but we're working with our state and federal agency partners to collect and analyze data, both existing data, collect new data through new studies. Um, we are working to develop a thorough and transparent regulatory process. Um, and then, as be has been mentioned, a lot of time and effort has been put into stakeholder outreach and collaboration, and that will be ongoing. Next slide, please. So just before I conclude, I want to focus on um, sort of our big next step. And commission staff is really focused on preparing for a federal consistency determination that will occur prior to the lease sale. And we have been actively working with BOEM and all the other state and federal agencies to ensure that we have adequate information to conduct that review. I want to highlight this because I think this is the, the sort of one regulatory opportunity for the state and stakeholders and the public to weigh in on the leasing and siting discussion that's going on um, within a public hearing setting. So um, we will be looking for input from all of you and from agencies and anybody who would like to have input. Um, once that we go through that phase, then we'll be moving on to really focusing on the development of mitigation um, and monitoring strategies as we move forward in offshore wind. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're really grateful. We'd like to be able to just ask a few questions and then we'll bring up our next panel here. Uh, appreciate all of you again for being here. Uh, um, Mr. Potter, talk about the ideal date when we're going to see these studies back and how you're going to be able to bring them together. And can you give us a brief synopsis about what each uh, university is looking at uh, and where you think our focus needs to be? Yeah, I, I, can, I can give you a little bit, um, and then Mark Severi is here. He can talk a little bit more in detail what we're funding at Humboldt State. But um, essentially, the, the, the three primary projects that we're funding right now will have results uh, within a year's time frame, and there will be interim products that will um, that will be delivered to the state. Um, and the timing is such that that we think will, you know, certainly help the Coast Commission, for instance, with its consistency uh, determination and uh, and with some of the planning that will be, you know, rolling out up here as well. So, are you going to go over? Yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll leave the Humboldt State. So of course. The, yeah. uh, sure. But okay. So. The, the, the study that we're funding at Humboldt is... Uh, and you is can just briefly go over that because I know Mr. Severi will, will okay, talk great. about it. Okay, yeah. great. So basically, it would be looking at the, the impacts to the marine environment, um, the coastal environment. It will look at some of the, um, the port side issues. Um, it will also be looking at, um, I mean, you know, you know, impacts in Humboldt Bay itself. And then we're funding a study at Humble, I'm sorry, at Berkeley that um, looks at uh, potential workforce uh, ramping up in California for offshore wind industry. And then we're also funding um, a grid integration analysis. And we're still working on the scope of, of those two studies, but we anticipate having that that done probably within the next couple of weeks. And then something that, that is not related to offshore wind is a study at UC Santa Cruz, which is looking at the potential um, for tidal energy along the California coast. Tidal, tidal yeah. Or high, it's actually broader than that. It's the whole suite of marine kinetic. It's not only tidal. I'm sorry, ma'am. We'll, we're going to have you uh, um, just wait until I'm under sorry, public comment. I know, ma'am, so how about we compromise with you? If you just want to write it down, and uh, I will make sure we ask the question if that's okay with you. And we're going to ask Leroy if you can assist us with that. Um, and if you don't mind just writing your question down, we'll get it right up. Thank you. Mr. Potter, anything else? No, that's, I think that's it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, talk to us about what, on the international um, side, we have seen several countries aggressively go after offshore wind energy. Can you talk to us about lessons learned uh, and what California should avoid um, from other nations advancing wind energy? Open to the panel, and I'm going to start with the Coast Commission. So I think I've, uh, 
It's probably a better question for either BOEM or the Energy Commission. I think they've been a little bit more engaged on the international front. I will say that we look forward to you to understanding what kind of processes that were set up internationally that worked and didn't work, um, and the data they collected, and what information did they use to make these decisions. Now, our offshore environment is not the same as either the East Coast or internationally, so it's not a direct link. Um, but it, part of it is, for me at least, is understanding which processes were put in place, like for engagement uh, with different communities or a collection of environmental data. Um, but I think we're still in the process, at least I am, of figuring that out and what it, which ones worked and which ones didn't. Why don't we go to Boehm? Anything that we especially want to avoid uh, that may not have worked that uh, they actually thought would, and anything, any model uh, rules and regulations that you think um, the U.S. should be advancing? Um, I think certainly we need to learn from those in Europe. And BOEM's International uh, Affairs Office is engaged with uh, the various European countries that have developed offshore wind. Um, we have agreements with them to try to periodically have um, updates on what they're doing and learn about, you know, lessons learned. A lot of it primarily are though on fixed foundations right now. So, um, you know, floating foundation is up and coming and we'll, we'll begin to see that become more matured. Um, and we'll continue to have those dialogues with our international partners and to the extent that we can bring that at the state level, we certainly would, would be willing to do that. But we are engaging with our European partners to learn um, what's been done there and what didn't work or what would work as it would apply to California. So Thank going you. forward, we'd be interested in, you know, we'll, we'll um, bring that down to the state. That's great. Ms. Wayne? Uh, <clears throat> yes, so um, offshore wind is an advanced, uh, more, mat more mature industry in Europe. Um, the Energy Commission does have memorandums of understanding with both Denmark and Scotland that we completed in uh, 2018. And so we're looking forward to working with those countries to kind of learn from them as to what they've done with their projects um, as they continue to monitor those projects that have been installed, what they're seeing in terms of the data, in terms of you know um, the production that's coming from their uh, offshore wind turbines, uh, you know any other issues that they're experiencing, what they did to get those projects completed, uh, any mitigations they had with fishermen and other communities. And so we've already kicked off the initial steps to learning from them. We had a meeting in September um, of last year with uh, federal state agencies and Denmark and Scotland to uh, set, a set up a basis for learning from them and how we could do an information exchange. And when do you expect that to be able to come back to, this, to the Energy Commission? Into this year, as far as the lessons learned that they would not repeat, et cetera. When would, that, when would you be able to speak to that? Um, so it's, I mean, I don't know if there's a certain time frame as to when they'll get us information back. Um, what I think our next step is to meet with stakeholders in this offshore when planning effort and identify key questions that we need to ask them, um, you know, and provide those, that, those questions to Denmark and Scotland. Um, I think they're willing and ready to provide us with any information that they can. Uh, we just need to identify what areas that we're most concerned with or most needing information. Thank you. Please, Mr. Potter. One thing to add to the, the conversation, it, it, from the limited exposure I've had uh, to the European uh, in, offshore wind industry is they, they seem to have developed a, a fair amount of technology around monitoring, which we could definitely use, implement here. That's great. There's been a lot of discussion about timeline throughout the state, uh, that we may be seeing turbines by X date. Fill us in uh, for California. When do you think that we would actually see that, uh, if you will, constructing on land and installing offshore. What is your gut? Um, certainly we are in the initial phase of the process. We have not even identified wind energy areas, let alone potential lease areas. So we still need to do environmental on that and then issue a lease. If all the planets line up and mm -hmm. we actually had a lease sale mid to late 2020, the a lease does not guarantee or uh, provide authorization to construct. It simply gives the um, lessee the ability to further characterize um, the ocean and, and do some micrositing and prepare its engineering report. And when they have all of the information on their facility design in complete detail so that we can do an environmental analysis and an EIS level, um, that's the only time. And it would take them a few years to put that together. 
Um, and then only after approval of those plans can they begin to construct. So um, it's a multi-year process. If, you know, if we had lessees by 2020, it could be, you know, and don't quote me on this, but 2025? Yeah. Some time frame? Again, very rough, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a multi-year process, and there's plenty of time for engagement, and, uh, you know, that's a lot of things have to happen before then. Thank you. Talking about fisheries, so I want to go to the good doctor there. So you talked about we're not even, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, we're not even at the point to start talking about mitigation. We are focusing on avoidance. So when it comes to avoiding impacts when, with fisheries, and especially how challenged California fisheries have been over these past four years, uh, what are you looking to uh, to be able to avoid those impacts? I don't think we'll be able to avoid all impacts to fishing. I just I think everybody in this room understands that's not a likely outcome um, given how broad um, the fishing resources are in California, especially here in the North Coast. So the point what we're trying to do now is gather information, which is a difficult task um, that to give us an understanding of where those resources are and how we can minimize impacts to those. This is, it's a, actually quite a, a complex process. We've been working with local fishing organizations here in the North Coast and individual fishermen um, to develop a process that everybody can buy into, both the agencies but and the fishing community, so that the result is, um, again, a process that everybody is working together towards and the product that everybody can buy into. And when I say a product, what I mean is a discussion of what fishing resources are and then a discussion about how do we site offshore wind in these areas so that those impacts are minimized. Um, the mitigation discussion is a critical component of that. I don't want to make it sound like we're not thinking about that because we most certainly are, but the specifics of what that might look like, I think, is we're just that's what we're not quite we haven't quite gone down that road yet um, we're still working with the fishing communities to try to develop the impacts so as we heard from Ms. Smite about uh, very rough uh, and we are not holding her to this timeline right but I'm just going to use it as an example let's just say we're looking at uh, putting something in in 2025 just as an example I want to make sure that folks are leaving understanding the state side about the rules and regulation and how that process coincides with a hard date after a lease has been issued and uh, actually being able to see someone build something offshore. What do folks need to know about the rules, the regulations, and how those would be adopted, and what does that process look like? Please. Um, so I can speak to the Coastal Commission process. Okay. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned on my slide, we have a regulatory role here, um, especially on the federal portions of the project, which, is, which I think is critical. Um, so, and that happens in two, look, two time frames. The first is prior to the lease sale. As you um, heard Ms. Sumate mention, um, they are going to be doing an environmental analysis on uh, prior to the lease sale. They'll be developing a document um, but before they go to the lease sale, they will submit um, a federal consistency determination to the Coastal Commission. At that point, the Coastal Commission will review um, the lease areas or the proposed lease areas, and um, our intent at that point is to do sort of a broad siting scale analysis about what the potential impacts from wind development would be on those from those proposed lease areas. Um, and as I mentioned, that's an important time for everybody here to plug in to the state process. Um, once, if we get past that phase, as, as again, we, you heard, there's a process where the developers then uh, collect additional data, develop their projects more extensively. Um, they will develop a plan and go to BOEM for approval of those plans. Those plans also need to come through the Coastal Commission for federal consistency review. So we will be reviewing the specifics of now we know where the, oh, excuse me, where the turbines are located and what the specific, we can actually get to the nitty gritty of an impact analysis. So that's the other, and that is an open regulatory process in front of the Coastal Commission. Um, so that's another entry from, from on the federal side. There's also the, and, the and state water on, side. Is that mm -hmm. a parallel effort with the feds that, that you would be launching? So please talk about that. Yeah, so it is, it is in partnership with the federal government. It's a process that's 
um, described in the Coastal Zone Management Act, and the Coastal Commission implements that law for the state of California. Um, and so it's, and this is how it was done in the in the other states that have done offshore wind or even offshore oil and gas. So it's um, it is a well established process. We'll be working with the federal uh, government, specifically with BOEM, to and make sure that we get all the information we need to do that review. Um, when we get down to the project specific phase, we'll be working with individual project proponents as well um, to get all the details of the project so we can review it under the Coastal Act. That's great. Mr. Potter? I would also mention that you know there's a role, of course, for the State Lands Commission in the cables that would come on shore in, in, you know, in leasing for those purposes. And State Lands Commission uh, has the authority over Bay Bottom and uh, exactly. on those leases. Um, so, so how many state agencies would you see involved in the permitting? Um, on at the state level, the Coastal Commission would have a permitting action. State Lands would likely have a permitting action. Um, CDFW. CDFW yeah. would have a would also likely have a permitting action, and then but that's and that's. For the state waters component, there are potential onshore components that then have an even broader array of regulatory needs. So if we're looking at port improvements, that brings in a whole other um, set of local and state agencies and federal agencies as well that will have actions. So um, it's a lot of folks that are going to weigh in and weigh, weigh in on these projects. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Um, and while uh, so some other agencies to consider while they won't have a permitting role in offshore wind they will have a regulatory or um, exploratory role in this so California independent system operator as well as the Cal as well as the California Public Utilities Commission and um, we have included them in our broader efforts around offshore wind that's wonderful thank you so much uh, any closing comments that you all would like to be able to make uh, at this time before we transition to our next panel or any items that uh, we may have forgotten to ask Here in the same none. All right. Thank you so much for your time. We're very grateful. Um, there's going to be some follow-ups from this panel that we'd like to be able when we advance our second hearing. One of the follow-ups that we'll have is lessons learned, um, especially on the environmental side and fishery protection side. And we'd like to be able to follow up on those OPC um, uh, studies that are being advanced at the universities and make sure that you have the latest information. We'd like to be able to say thank you to our uh, first panel very much. Let's give them a round of applause, please. We're now going to be transitioning uh, to our industry panel. The focus of our industry panel is how offshore wind projects can mitigate, mitigate potential environmental impacts at sea. And we're going to be hearing from uh, the industry. We have Kevin Bannister here today. He's Fi Vice President of Development for Principal Power. Uh, representing the home team, we have Mr. Severi here today, Senior Research Engineer from Humboldt State University at the Schatz Energy Research Center, who has been front and center on these discussions. And we also have Danielle Mills, who's here today. She's a director with the American Wind Energy Association based here in California. Uh, as each of those panelists are making their way, we're going to ask to be able to switch out the um, name tags. Thank you so much to Carlene and to Tay-Tay for all the work on that. We'd like to be able to welcome the chairperson of the Board of Supervisors who is here today, Mr. Rex Bone. Thank you so much, Supervisor Bone, for joining us as well. Uh, as our panelists are uh, taking a seat, we want to say thank you to our media services team here from the California State Senate. Thank you so much to Dana and to Phil for all their hard work and our sergeants who are here today, Jeremiah and Leroy. So ladies and gentlemen, we now would like to be able to welcome our industry panel uh, to the hearing. We're really grateful that the three of you are here. We're going to start out with Mr. Bannister. He's the Vice President of Development at Principal Power. Uh, you have five minutes, sir. We welcome you to Humboldt County. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, Senator McGuire, and um, really uh, honored to be here. So thanks for, for inviting Principal Power to testify. Um, as uh, the Senator said, my name is Kevin Bannister, and I'm Vice President of Development for Principal Power, uh, which means that I'm responsible for uh, the development of our company's global pipeline of projects um, and opportunities. But what we're working on here in California um, is especially close to our hearts, um, and that's especially because we're a California company. Um, and uh, we view here in Humboldt County as um, uh, a place that with investment could become the shoreside hub for offshore wind deployments up and down uh, the West Coast. 
Um, I guess more importantly, it's always a pleasure to be here in Eureka, um, and it's a pleasure that uh, this morning the fog did not interrupt um, my travel schedule as it has uh, many times in the past, so really happy to have gotten here on time. Um, we're an offshore wind services and technology company that offers the floating foundation solution to developers, uh, utilities, and independent power producers around the world. Um, and while we have established offices in Europe and are engaged in significant activities in Asia, the technology itself was born here in California, where we're headquartered. Um, uh, one could say that the technology has been raised in Europe, uh, where today we have three projects totaling uh, 100 megawatts of capacity under construction or, under ad or in advanced stages of development. Um, these projects will come online in Portugal, Scotland, and France in 2019, 2020, and 2021, respectively. Um, these projects either are or will be project financed, meaning that the commercial debt providers, which tends to be very conservative money, um, have had their questions about technical status and performance satisfactorily answered. Uh, this along with the progress from other of our friends in the industry like Equinor, um, if uh, folks have heard of Equinor, and their high wind technology, which has deployed a 30 megawatt project offshore Scotland, um, it demonstrates that floating wind really has arrived as a viable and important opportunity to meet renewable energy goals. Indeed, there are gigawatts, thousands of megawatts of projects dependent on floating wind foundations under planning and development around the world. In California, um, the opportunity is immense. Projects have already been proposed for the central and northern coast of the state, and a recent report produced by the American Jobs Project projects the industry could employ over 17,000 people and provide close to 20 gigawatts of capacity to the grid by the 2040s. Previous reports from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, um, have projected similar numbers. So it's clear that offshore wind is a high capacity product, producing energy in a way and at times that is complementary to the solar resource in the state, um, and that it carries the potential to generate significant new economic activity and jobs. And Humboldt County is one of the areas that we believe could benefit the most. It's also an emission-free and environmentally friendly resource and has therefore become an important part of national planning globally to address climate change. But for California to benefit from the tremendous promise the industry presents, there are important considerations that should be addressed proactively. Among the most important is the interaction between floating offshore wind farms and the traditional, historical, and present users of the ocean space. In many places along the California coast, commercial fishing is deeply significant from both economic and cultural perspectives. Acknowledging and honoring the meaningful role that the fleets play is of genuine importance um, as new activity in the ocean are proposed. And this is why principal power, uh, guided by the partnership that we have with the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, RCEA, um, along with EDPR and Acker Solutions, uh, prioritized a ground up approach to siting our proposed project here, consulting with local fishing interests and other stakeholders and ultimately signing an MOU with the Humboldt Fisheries Marketing Association to ensure that we, as the project proponents, are held to account to the principles of collaboration that we think lead to better project development and better outcomes generally. Uh, the site that we identified after consultation is about 25 miles offshore, uh, just for reference. We know that other offshore wind developers in California feel and act the same way. Castle Wind, for example, has worked hard to build its relationship with fishing interests in the Morro Bay area. Uh, collaboration and cooperation of this nature is paramount. And so California should continue to engage with stakeholders invested in the ocean space. The state should seek to provide developers and stakeholders with as broad an array of options for development as possible so that from them, the best sites can be considered and if appropriate, developed. This includes continuing dialogue with the Department of Defense, for example, to pursue science-based analysis around areas that should, and in some cases, should not be open to development. This also includes analysis and action around the benefits that avail from investments in port or transmission infrastructure. But because offshore wind, excuse me, but because, off, because waters offshore California get deep quickly, floating solutions are required. Um, these technologies have advanced to the point that performance risks have been removed. Now we need to take advantage of the siting flexibility floating foundations offer and working with stakeholders up and down the state engage in the responsible planning and development to best serve California's goals. To conclude, the opportunity presented to California by offshore wind is large. So are the challenges. 
to maximize the industry's potential and the benefits that it can provide to the state and nation. The urgency to address these issues is also large, and we stand ready to assess to, to assist the committee in its deliberations uh, and to provide other information. I'm very happy to participate in the question and answer period after my testimony. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much, Mr. Bannister, for joining us. We will hold questions until each of our presenters. We're very grateful for that you're here. We want to say thank you so much to Mr. Severy, who is a senior research engineer at Schatz Energy Research Center. Uh, he really has been here on the ground working it uh, and working with the state on all issues of avoidance. Uh, how we can avoid impacts to the environment, wildlife, and fisheries. We're going to turn the floor over to you, sir. We welcome you. You have five minutes. Thank you, Senator McGuire. I appreciate the opportunity to, to provide the testimony today. Um, so I believe I have a, a presentation. I'll just let that come up. Um, offshore wind can play an important part in California's clean energy future and can help, meet the, help the state meet its target of 100% clean renewable energy by 2045. The offshore wind resource in California, and in particular on the North Coast, is one of the best in the continental U.S., with average wind speeds exceeding 10 meters per second in some locations. California's North Coast has a strong opportunity for offshore wind development <clears throat> because of the sup sur superb wind resource, existing deep water port infrastructure in Humboldt Bay, and limited overlap with U.S. military operations. However, there are several challenges to development. These include electric transmission constraints, port infrastructure requirements, stakeholder concerns, environmental impacts, and geological, geologic or seismic issues. And your PowerPoint is up and running. Well, Thank page you. This, you this like? slide's fine for now. Okay, perfect. Um, the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University is working on feasibility analysis to quantify the opportunities for energy and economic development, and also understand the challenges, impacts, and constraints of offshore wind development on the North Coast. Next slide, please. At the Schott Center, we're working on three projects, one of which has been funded, and the other two have been proposed and are pending funds. The projects occur over a one-year timeline and are beginning this spring. Results and outcomes will be disseminated by winter and spring of 2020. I'll briefly describe the scope and status of each of the three project proposals. The first project looks at the wind resource, generation profile, and transmission constraints. This project has been proposed to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and is pending funding. The project will look at the following tasks. First, <clears throat> the resource assessment will be used to evaluate the wind speed resource and calculate the potential energy generation profile from different wind farm scales and locations on the North Coast. Second, we'll be looking at the grid compatibility, which will evaluate the electrical transmission capacity to connect offshore wind into the regional grid. Transmission capacity is very limited in Humboldt County and significant upgrades will likely be required for offshore wind development. This task will partner with Pacific Gas um, and Electric, our local utility, to run a power flow transmission model and estimate the required infrastructure upgrade costs, costs for different wind farm scales. <coughs> Next, this project will be looking at, the, at a subsea cable <clears throat> to determine the options and feasibility for a subsea cable to transmit power from load centers, um, fr from wind farms in, on the North Coast to load centers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, lastly, we will <clears throat> conduct an economic analysis to d develop a bottom-up cost model to calculate the costs for offshore wind energy for different development scales in this region. Next, there is a project that evaluates the concerns surrounding offshore wind development. This is a multidisciplinary project that has been awarded and funded through the California Ocean Protection Council. This project includes four tasks as described there in green. First, <clears throat> the environmental impact task. <clears throat> this will analyze the likely and potential environmental impacts to birds, marine mammals, fish, <clears throat> benthic or organisms, and other relevant species. We are working with ecological consultants, H.T. Harvey and Associates, to complete this analysis. Second, we'll be looking at coastal infrastructure. This task will assess current conditions of coastal infrastructure, including the port and harbor, and describe the anticipated upgrades required to serve an offshore wind industry. Mott McDonald, an engineering consulting firm with expertise in offshore wind and port de development, will be assisting with this work. Next, we'll be looking at stakeholder engagement to identify stakeholder benefits and concerns and determine approaches to address these <coughs> issues. 
Stakeholders include commercial and recreational fishing community, environmental organizations, developers, regulators, labor unions, and others. Lastly, this project will include a policy analysis to evaluate environmental permitting processes and energy policy related to offshore wind at local, state, and federal levels. This portion of the work will have a strong focus in energy, policy, in energy policy to understand the complex pathway and timeline to integrate offshore wind into state electricity markets. Lastly, the third project looks at, looks at some additional considerations for offshore wind development. This project has been proposed to the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research and is pending funding. The project is looking at three main issues. First, military mission compatibility. This task will investigate how development of offshore wind on the North Coast can be done in a way that is compatible, compatible with military operations in Northern California. Next, <clears throat> there was a task looking at the geologic and seismic concerns. <clears throat> this task will assess the geologic and seismic issues associated with seafloor anchor anchoring, and in particular, it will also look at uh, the issues with horizontal directional drilling for cable landfall into the bay. Lastly, there will be a subsea cable environmental analysis, which will conduct an, a preliminary environment, environmental analysis of a subsea transmission line, including impacts to benthic organisms and other marine life and ecosystems. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We're at the beginning of our feasibility analyses for offshore wind. In the short time available today, I'm able to describe our, our work at a, at a high level, but I'm not able to go into that much detail. You're welcome to ask any questions about any piece of this analysis or follow up by email with more information. Our contact information is shown here <clears throat> for me and then also for the principal investigator, Arnie Jacobson. Arnie is the director of the Shots Energy Research Center and he was unfortunately unable to be here because he's traveling internationally for other work. You can look at our center's website for more information and for interim per reports and deliverables that will be published there when they're complete. Thank you again, Senator McGuire, for your time here today, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you so much. We're very grateful, sir, and we'll be asking some questions here in just a bit. We are appreciative that Danielle Mills is here. She's with the American Wind Energy Association based here in California. We welcome you, Ms. Mills, to the committee. You have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you, Senator. It's a pleasure to be here today and um, really appreciate you welcoming us to this beautiful community on this lovely day. Yeah. Um, I'm Danielle Mills with the American Wind Energy Association of California. AWEA is the U.S. trade association that represents the wind industry. Um, and our member companies are global leaders in utility scale wind energy technologies who are interested in delivering the benefits of utility scale wind, both onshore and offshore, to Californians. Um, American Wind Power was born in California, roughly around the same year as me. Um, and offshore wind energy is the future. Um, AWEA California and our member companies are applying the lessons that we've learned from our experiences with land-based wind, um, as well as our experiences on the East Coast with offshore winds to the California market to make sure that California offshore wind starts off on the right foot um, and in a manner that maximizes the value that it brings to California. Uh, one of those lessons is that it's really critical to collaborate early with environmental and other stakeholders um, and often throughout the process of development. Um, and it's clear that offshore wind energy is coming to California. Companies are hiring and watching the market for signals of stability and opportunities for growth. That opportunity is enormous. Um, Kevin mentioned the, the job study that uh, explained that over 17,000 jobs could come to California. Um, if we maximize the potential opportunity and see about 18 gigawatts of development off the coast. That's an enormous number, and if we're going to get to a, a significant um, market like that, we need to make sure that every step of the way we're checking in with the critical stakeholders who will be interacting with these projects on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we have to start with the best projects in the best places and make sure that we get it right with our eyes on scaling up. Offshore wind has potential to revitalize port communities like Eureka um, and to bring manufacturing to the stake, state, and California is very well positioned to tap into that potential um, given the 100% clean energy policies that we have um, and our carbon neutral goal. On the East Coast, offshore wind continues to adva advance, uh, improving economies and through robust state policies 
that have recently been signed into law by a bipartisan group of governors. So leaders in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and Maryland have all made, and Virginia also, have all made very substantial offshore wind commitments. And we expect offshore wind to continue to mirror the um, cost declines that we've seen with land-based wind throughout the country. We know that offshore wind can complement California's generation and load profile. So Kevin also mentioned, uh, as did LeQuinn, I believe, the, the complementary nature between wind and solar in the state. So as we move to higher penetrations of renewable energy, um, we know that the solar is very predictable. It comes offline around uh, 6 o'clock p.m. roughly when the sun is setting. That is exactly the time where offshore wind resources are ramping up and starting to blow the hardest. Those resources can continue to blow throughout the, throughout the evening and uh, through the night, which can help us charge our electric vehicle fleets. California also has very aggressive uh, electrification targets and can also help with nighttime heating loads in the building and industry sector. So there's enormous pop, uh, opportunity for decarbonization there as well. <clears throat> Um, we also know that offshore wind can have a capacity factor between 60 and 70 percent based on what we've seen in European markets. Roughly what that means is that you see, um, just, just as a sense of scale, coal and natural gas have capacity factors of 54 or 55 percent uh, throughout the U.S. So essentially offshore wind will be generating uh, more of the time than some of those conventional resources. It can have enormous decarbonization benefits. Um, and we know that it's also, uh, it's also um, going to bring those jobs to the state as well. But in order to get there, we know that collaboration is going to be key. So I'm going to talk about three different areas where uh, OIA is collaborating and individual companies as well um, to make sure that we're doing this responsibly. The offshore wind industry, we know in, uh, through the work that we've done with the Department of Defense, can enhance national security and is compatible with military operations and readiness. Um, we know that adding energy independence in an offshore uh, homegrown energy source like offshore wind can help reduce our reliance on foreign energy sources and enhance our national security. Um, and, and we've seen this on the land-based side. Uh, we're ready to work with the Department of Defense. We are doing so in Washington, D.C., as well as the Coast Guard and the Navy. Um, and we're finding workable project siting locations. Um, we also know that we can coexist with the commercial and recreational fishing industries and diverse, uh, diversify and strengthen the U.S. maritime economy. We're seeing that through individual company efforts, like what Kevin mentioned, um, and uh, engaging as well in some of the ongoing studies that are happening uh, with the offshore projects on the East Coast, like Block Island. You have about 30 seconds. Okay. And um, we've also learned a great deal from our work with the environmental groups who, with whom we partner on the American Wind and Wildlife Institute. Uh, this is a partnership of industry leaders, agencies, and conservation groups that work together to ensure and facilitate the timely development of renewable energy, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to develop uh, projects responsibly without affecting wildlife or their habitat. So excuse my voice. Um, <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, we're really grateful for this. I think we have seen that California is already following best practices by having this meeting early. There are no projects online. We have a really great chance to get this right, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mills. We're very grateful. And to our uh, panel, I would like to be able to start out with some questions. Um, first of all, I would like to be able to go to uh, the Schatz Energy Center first. So talk about in your belief, so there's been some discussion about 10 wind uh, turbines off of the Humboldt Coast. So what type of upgrades do you see may be needed? And if you can just walk us through that, and how many megawatts would that be? Is that 100 megawatts? Just, just give us a, a, an overview, if you don't mind. Um, yes, so if there were 10 megawatts, a, a typical size um, people are looking at is maybe 10 to 12 megawatts per turbine, so that would be around 100 to 120 megawatts for, for that particular farm. Um, <clears throat> as Danielle mentioned, with a 60 or 70 percent capacity factor, they'll be producing at most, uh, we don't need to get into the details about how much energy they're producing. I guess upgrades will be required in several places, not only the port, but also in particular the transmission upgrades. I don't believe that Humboldt County's grid has the capacity to absorb 100 or even 50 additional megawatts of electricity um, right now. So significant upgrades will be required. 
either in the overland transmission lines going east to the to the Interstate 5 corridor or potentially going south along existing utility right of ways. So it will be significant electricity transmission upgrades, but then also significant port development will be required both to um, do the assembly, but also ongoing operations and maintenance of the of the turbines. So, so Sivri or Mr. Panister, so how, how has that price breakdown or that investment breakdown uh, happened in other regions? So can you give us um, in uh, rural areas, whether it's on the East Coast or internationally, uh, that we need to be able to uh, increase the capacity for transmission? How is that uh, investment breakdown taken hold? Who pays for it? Well, it's a good question, um, and certainly it's it's relevant to offshore wind development in California. Um, I, as was uh, certainly implied, anyway, in the, in, by the previous panel, um, it is done differently in different places. And um, where we've seen offshore wind take hold sort of first, um, really in northern Europe, so maybe in you know Denmark and the Netherlands and even in the U.K., Germany, in these places – Generally, what's happened is that uh, the central government has um, has actually provided access to transmission to the project developer, and that's and it's incorporated. It's not a part of what the what the what the what the developer includes in the cost that the consumer sees for those projects. So it's something that obviously it's seen either through taxes or through through a, like a feed-in tariff type arrangement. But so the developer it's taken care of by by somebody else. So like gonna, the transmission organizer, for example. Sure. So I'm just going to paraphrase here. So let's just say we're going to have 10 uh, off the Humboldt Coast. Uh, again, just hypothetical. 10 off the, the coast, 100, 120 megawatts. It may be in the hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to create, to be able to expand the capacity for those transmission lines in some areas in northern Europe. The, the government has paid for the upgrade of the transmission lines right. while the private uh, industry um, contractor has installed the turbine turbines and the connector cables. Is that accurate? I'm oversimplifying. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think f from our perspective, we think that uh, for the project here in Humboldt, we think that um, there may be some ways that we can avoid the major upgrades uh, that would result in a, you know, additional hundreds of millions of dollars of costs for an initial project. Um, I think you've you've summarized the situation well, though. Yeah. Do you want to talk about those? About some ways to be able to mitigate the the cost, if you don't mind. Um, well, uh, I'm not really qualified to talk about sort of the transmission sort of wraparounds that we might be able to achieve here in uh, in Humboldt County. Transmission, as you may know, is a you know, like an almost an impossibly complex uh, 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 area. Um, so that's, that, that's a tough one for me. I'm going to add that as a follow-up. Okay. So we'll um, talk about lessons learned internationally. So we were asking the last panel about lessons learned, especially when it comes to fisheries and the environment. So what, what measures have been deployed by both private industry as well as government to be able to uh, have compatible uses, allow the fleet to continue to operate as well as have the renewable energy. Can either three of you talk about that at all? Not all at once. <laughs> I don't have the I don't have the global perspective from sure. Europe. I think um, California has had a lot of experiences. The previous panel explained with yeah. um, you know making sure that we're minimizing impacts for a variety of different technologies, and it's, it's, we've been doing it for hydropower for a long time. So there are a lot of different lessons that we can use and apply from other technologies as well as other parts of the country, but I don't have the information on okay. environmental issues globally. Thank you. I can follow up. Please. Um, I, I also have more of a, a local focus here, but I th I'd say that one thing um, that, that could be a lesson learned from the East Coast is states setting um, targets for offshore wind development helps give the industry both a vision of how they're moving forward, but also gives the state some ability to plan ahead appropriately, both for transmission, but also for environmental concerns. So the, the environmental studies, the environmental study that you're advancing now at SHOTS, how, how will it be able to overlap, for example, with the Central Coast? Or is it more just focused on the North Coast? Fill us in on that. Uh, 
strategy. This will also be very focused on the North Coast. We're going to be looking specifically at two separate areas. One of those is the Boehm Call area, and one of them is further south off Cape Mendocino that has really superb wind speeds. Within that area and, and just around it, we're going to be looking at population, seasonal patterns of migration, what type of birds, fish, marine mammals are there. And these are going to be very specific to the region and the unique uh, ecosystems we have up here. So I think maybe some of the results and methods may be transferable to different regions, but I think it's going to be very focused on understanding what are the potential impacts up here. The other two studies that have yet to be funded, let's just say you kick off tomorrow, are you ta talking 12, 24 months? How long would it take you, do you think, to be able to complete? These are all 12-month projects. Um, we're hoping and expecting that um, the other two will be beginning within a month or two, and uh, we still expect to be hitting deadlines of, of next spring or, or for, for results and reports. And would you describe these studies as initial, uh, or will you need to be able to go back to be able to do further review after what you find from this, these uh, studies that you're launching now? I think different tasks have, will have different levels of detail. So for example, when we're looking at a subsea cable for long distance transmission, that's gonna be at a very high level because it's a preliminary thing, nothing similar has been done on the West Coast. But other aspects of the study, such as the transmission integration, will be, will be detailed and be pretty uh, final with, with that uh, aspect of it. That's great. We'd like to be able to just talk about uh, the floating turbines. Can you just uh, give us a 30,000 foot view uh, of what the timeline for construction is offshore uh, and what that would look like, just so that we have a, a visual leaving here today? Uh, I don't know if, Severy, Mr. Bannister. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and I'll also just give a quick description of what our technology looks like, just, just to help Please. people visualize. So basically, um, uh, w our technology, we call it the wind float. There are three columns that, um, if you look at it from above, effectively form an equilateral triangle, um, uh, just circular columns. Um, upon one of those columns, we affix the wind turbine. And the idea is that we affix the wind turbine in the protected environment of, of a harbor, and then we tow out that fully assembled unit to the project site. And at the project site, we would have pre-deployed uh, the mooring and what's called the export cable, so the cable that actually brings the power to shore. Uh, so the operation is uh, happens all at shore, with the exception of the tow out, and then the connection of the mooring lines and the cables. So each of these systems will have one mooring line that extends off of each of the columns. So a total of three mooring lines uh, for each wind turbine. Um, the foundation itself. Uh, our team uh, has, a, from some time ago, has a history in oil and gas. Uh, the, the foundation is called a semi-submersible. That's the sort of the type of foundation it is. This type of foundation um, has been deployed in places like the Gulf of Mexico and in the North Sea for decades and decades. So there's a lot of experience with this type of foundation. What we're talking about is much, much smaller than the sort of the Gulf of Mexico, you know, enormous like oil type of uh, type of systems. Um, so the construction window uh, can be fairly compressed. Um, because we're not reliant on heavy lift operations offshore, like you would see uh, for what we would call a conventional or bottom fixed offshore wind project where you know you have a foundation, you pile it into the seabed, and then you bring out the whole, you know, the, on, a, on a vessel you bring out the tower, the nacelle, the blades, and then you have to lift that all the way up to what's called the hub height, which may be, you know, 300, 350 feet above the sea's surface. We do all of that work at shore. So the offshore works are much, much simpler with floating systems like ours. So at 100 megawatt project, that's, you know, it is confined some to the to open weather windows. We, it's difficult, going to be difficult to be out there in January doing this type of work. Um, but uh, in the you know, call it from April through October, uh, depending on the con consultations that we have with especially the environmental uh, stakeholders and also fishing interests, what times are open for those types of activities, it would take two seasons, I would imagine. Uh, so, you know, maybe one summer and then another summer to deploy the full uh, 100 megawatts. Um, I think as the industry matures here in California, that will be compressed further as we all, you know, learn from, learn by doing and get better at it. Got it. And 
you talked about jobs. Talk with us about permanent jobs, one time uh, or temporary, if you will, in the construction phase. So go through that if you, if you don't mind, Mr. Bannister. Um, certainly there are construction phase jobs and then there's O&M uh, jobs. Uh, which are, you know, for the life of the project. And I think one of the things that is quite compelling, we're seeing it now in the onshore uh, wind world where a lot of the, the turbines and towers that are, you know, placed onshore are now being recommissioned and repowered. And with floating uh, foundation technologies like ours, that opportunity exists to do the same. So maybe a project has a 20 or 25 year life. You can tow the foundation back to shore, replace the turbine. The turbine in this case is the sensitive piece of equipment that has a shorter life than the foundation itself. So there is, there is the opportunity not for the, for the sort of one-time work of, of construction, the ongoing work of operation and maintenance, and then there will be opportunities for, we think, for repowering uh, for existing projects. But we also see that the opportunity in California is so large. When we're talking about 20 gigawatts by the 2040s, 2040s is only 20, you know, 20 something years from now. Um, that is a, that's a lot of work to be done. So they may be one-time jobs uh, for a particular project, but we do, do see the potential for um, projects to be developed and ultimately constructed in parallel. Got it. Thank you so much. Ms. Mills? Yeah, and we have seen this on the land-based side as well. There are right now 13 manufacturing facilities in California that support land-based wind um, and wind turbine technician training programs within the state that, um, you know, that go out and service turbines throughout the country. Um, so if we see, you know, a robust wind resource in New Mexico or Wyoming, they can go there. You can do the same thing with offshore wind. Um, there's also, you know, I think this is why um, keeping our eyes on a, a larger target is really helpful because that's what will actually bring the supply chain into California earlier in the process so that we can get some of these parts manufactured in California and then, you know, if we get to a point where there's additional development throughout the Pacific, be exporting some of those parts um, throughout throughout the world. Thank you so much. We'd like to be able to see if there's any closing comments, and I'd like to be able to do our follow-ups as well. Any closing comments for either the three of you? We'll start with Ms. Mills and I'll work our way to the left. Ms. Mills. No, I just uh, encourage you to continue to lean on us as a resource, and um, we'd like to interact with a lot of the important stakeholders who are here today and moving forward to make sure that we do this right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Severy. I look forward to the opportunity to present some of our results after we've gotten into the studies a little bit further. That'd be great. Yeah, have that as a follow-up. Thank you so much, Mr. Bannister. Uh, I would just uh, say that there are several lessons that we are bringing from Europe. Um, some of them are kind of down in the details, you know, uh, the things about cable protection systems that, uh, that will make the cables last longer, which means that you have to deploy them less frequently. I would say that floating foundations themselves in some ways are a lesson learned from Europe. Um, we see significantly reduced risk uh, uh, and, in fact, a significantly reduced environmental impact when using floating foundations. So we deploy pretty conventional offshore anchors that are entirely removable as opposed to doing piling into the seabed, which not entirely, but is a very pretty, pretty common practice for the bottom fixed foundations. And we know that those, you know, that se severe sort of acoustic signature that comes with that piling is really detrimental for marine mammals in particular. So with floating foundations, there's, there's you know, less impact in the deployment and installation phase. And then perhaps the greatest benefit, there's been a lot of discussion about where we are in this, in this practice now is avoidance, you know, trying to avoid harm. Floating foundations give you greater opportunity to do that because you can, you're not dependent so much on what the seabed conditions are or how deep the water is. You can go to the place where first, maybe where the wind is good, but also maybe the first place that you go is where, you know, the a variety of stakeholders say this is where we think you should go and the wind resource is sufficient to enable an economic project. So it provides a tremendous amount of flexibility that, that's really valuable. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. If we can please give a round of applause for our industry panel. Thank you. As we move forward in our agenda, we want to say thank you uh, to all of you for hanging with us. We're going to be moving into the environmental perspective. Our next panel is titled Protecting Our Ocean Environment and Balancing the Need for Green Energy, Perspectives from Environmental Leaders. We are grateful that we're going to have Chet Ogan here today. He is uh, with the Redwood Region Audubon Society. Jennifer Savage, she is a proud Humboldt resident, and she's now the P California Policy Manager for the Surfrider Foundation. 
And we have Sandy Aylesworth here today with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful for all of their work. We are going to then hear from the fleet uh, in giving us their perspective from California's fishermen. We're going to have Chet here to the left, then Jennifer, then Sandy. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We're really grateful that the three of you are here. Uh, thank you for your hard work. Each of you have five minutes. I'll give you a 30 second prompt if we're getting close. We're gonna st start with Mr. Ogan, who is with the Audubon Society. Welcome, sir, in providing the environmental perspective. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for everyone for attending. Um, our Audubon chapter, along with California Audubon, is committed to sustainable, non-hydrocarbon energy sources, wind being one, solar being another. Hydropower, hydropower has its uh, problems with dams and uh, salmon migration and uh, pollu water pollution. So we're not, not considering that at all. Our uh, Redwood Region Audubon chapter, our purpose, we advocate for protection of birds and wildlife by supporting conservation efforts to protect wildlife and their habitat. Our, our mission is to promote a wise, balanced, and responsible and ethical use of natural ecosystems on a local, national, and global scale and protect the biotic and abiotic components of local, national, and global natural systems. Uh, the scope of our chapter covers all of Del Norte, Humboldt County, and adjacent areas of Siskiyou County, Mendocino County, and uh, Western Trinity County. Um, personally, I graduated from Humboldt State University in 1970 with a degree in biology, and uh, after graduation, went to work with the Forest Service in Southern California, uh, working in fire control and then in prescribed burning research um, with the experiment station down in Glendora. Um, After a four-year stint with the uh, U.S. Army at uh, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, D.C., I returned back up here to Humboldt State University because it was a good place to uh, raise a f to this area to raise a family where I uh, began working for Redwood Sciences Lab on their, uh, actually first on a uh, silviculture project which got disbanded and then uh, immediately picked up by a wildlife project. Uh, in 1983, and ever since from 1983 until my retirement in 2011, I worked as a as a wildlife biologist. Uh, I've been involved with with uh, Audubon since uh, 19 about 1987. Um, in uh, 1998, I spearheaded an effort to get Humboldt Bay Complex included in the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. And that was as a inter, as a uh, as an international site, and that was just recently upgraded this year to a hemispheric site. Um, very little is known about the bird component that we have offshore out here. Uh, it's it's uh, too far out for regular studies. Um, Dr. Stan Harris. Uh, Ornithology instructor emeritus from Humboldt State University has compiled notes going back to uh, 1940s and through his student studies and uh, research boats that have gone offshore have compiled some information on the uh, species that we have offshore. Um, there are at least 40 species that utilize the offshore waters off of California here. Um, and I want to... Uh, I want to highlight a couple of them. Well, well let me first start by uh, uh, including that now with a floating platform, you are in, in causing a uh, marine ecology area. You're, you're, you're creating a platform to which uh, algae will attach. Um, you'll get invertebrates then uh, collecting around those, uh, that algae and fish moving in around those uh, around those two. So you're, cre you're creating a, a microenvironment, uh, and I'm sure the fisheries people will be ad addressing that further. 
Um, we have a number of pelagic species that, uh, such as albatrosses, shearwaters, petrels, that uh, cruise the waters offshore. The um, strong westerlies that we have uh, pick up, cause, cause nutrient upwelling along the coast. That nutrient upwelling brings a lot of brings a lot of nutrient to the to the area, uh, providing a lot of food for bait uh, bait fish. And then you'll see these uh, long winged, narrow long winged uh, oceanic birds uh, cruising those water. They they are getting lift from wind shear off of the water. So most of the time they're going to be broadly just soaring. Uh, looking for looking for opportunities, but uh, you figure that once you get to an area where you have uh, an offshore structure, it could be an oil well, it could be a piece of, of uh, flotsam, uh, that where you have organisms attached to it, creating a small environment, uh, you're going to get small fish with that, and the uh, and potentially uh, balls of bait fish, in which these shearwaters. Uh, are not just cruising flat over a water at maybe uh, three meters, 10 feet high, but are circling and soaring high to spot these bait fish and then diving down um, to, to, get their, to get their food. Hey, 30 seconds, sir. Okay. Um, let me go to, uh, to the uh, slide then, please. I want to particularly particularly address black brant uh, along the coast here. Um, black uh, Humboldt Bay with its eelgrass is very important to to the black to the uh, Pacific black brant. Um, uh, they uh, feed on the they feed on the eelgrass in the bay. They migrate between the Alaska Peninsula and uh, Baja California, and then work their way up the coast. To Humboldt Bay, and then further on north up to the Puget Sound, and then uh, migrate um, migrate from Puget Sound up to the Alaska Peninsula, and even up to uh, up to Cham Kamchatka Peninsula. You'll see uh, that they're breeding up in up in this area here, as well as up in the High Arctic. Um, Concern about the black brant population is that a lot of not a lot is known about some of their winter ecology and so on. Uh, the uh, we have about 150,000 black brant Pacific brant in this area here, um, and that's about the, to 162,000, and that's about the limit. Uh, and they're counting those each year up in the Alaska Peninsula before they migrate south to allow. Uh, a hunting limit each year based on those numbers. Um, and I'm sorry, we're going to have to okay. conclude. I apologize. Would you, do you have any concluding remarks, please? Uh, no, thank you. No, no, no. Thank you so much, Mr. Elgin. And we'll, we'll uh, uh, wait till questions, and we'll come back with questions on uh, the specific migratory patterns in just a bit. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. We are grateful that Jennifer Savage is here. She's representing the Surfrider Foundation uh, and is the California Policy Manager for the Foundation. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. It's really great to be home and to see so many familiar faces. Oh, I can microphone. Yeah. I find Thank it, you. and I was instructed so well. Hey, there about you go. This. Nice. Still. You're good. You're good. So, <laughs> um, I was saying it's great to be home. It's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, thank you, Senator McGuire, for holding this forum, and um, thank you to the other panelists today. It's been really informative so far. In addition to working as Surfrider Foundation's California Policy Manager, um, I'm also a 21-year resident of Humboldt County. I've spent 17 of these years living in Manila along Humboldt Bay. I'm extremely familiar with the challenges and the benefits of living on the North Coast and the pride that we take in our connection to the natural world. I also served on the North Coast Regional Stakeholder Group during the Marine Life Protection Act implementation process, which proved to be a valuable opportunity and a privilege, really, to learn more about our ocean wildlife, the concerns of our local fishermen, the complexity of balancing multiple interests. To that end, Surfrider, NRDC, Sierra Club, National Audubon Society, and Defenders of Wildlife are among the many NGOs that have been tracking and commenting on California's offshore wind energy process as it's been moving along. First and foremost, Surfrider Foundation always strives to support renewable, low-impact sources of energy, of course. I mean, that's a no-brainer. 
breaking free of fossil fuels is a global imperative. It's truly the greatest imperative of our time. California's commitment to renewable energy is both necessary and admirable. But while renewable energy is obviously the right thing, we still have to do the right thing the right way. And that's where the concerns about offshore wind energy come in. While we support it in concept, we remain keenly aware that as related to our waters, the technology is still largely unproven and untested. Launching a project off our shore in an area critical to marine life must be done with utmost care and preparation. Um, as Chet discussed briefly, um, offshore wind farms can harm birds in a number of different ways. Electromagnetic fields, underwater noises and vibrations can affect orientation and navigational ability of our marine mammals. While newer wind turbine generators produce less sound than older turbines, impacts of low frequency sound on whales, dolphins and other ocean creatures still need to be investigated. Underwater support pilings, anchoring devices, scour protection materials and electromagnetic fields could cross, cause an increase or decrease in benthic communities, alter national environments and possibly affect migration patterns. Floating pa uh, power cables can lead to entanglement of whales and other marine mammals. And there's, there's other concerns as well, but Sandy will be speaking in greater details about those and other threats. So I will move on to say that despite the admirable quantity of meetings that BOEM and the CEC have held, what we're hearing from community members is a need for improved quality of meetings. Clearly opportunities exist for a more inclusive and transparent process that would ensure site selection reflects environmental and other concerns. <coughs> Surfrider and our colleague organizations have consistently advocated for a scientifically and stakeholder driven siting process that prioritizes environmental sensitivity. Specifically, we've asked the state to help secure funding for third party scientific analysis of the data in the data basin and the creation of an environmental sensitivity layer and to insist on a process that sets a high environmental bar for this new technology in the ocean that is so vital to our economy and our well-being. So we were hard to win last November at a Coastal Commission meeting. Representatives of the Coastal Commission, Energy Commission, and State Lands Commission adamantly supported these asks, but nearly six months later, there's been no follow-up. Even today, we've heard the phrase looking forward to in regards to figuring out virtually every single detail that needs to happen between now and actual deployment of the turbines if we should get so far, which is fine and it's appropriate, but it also suggests that building a wind farm out at sea has a lot of challenges yet to be solved. So while we want to embrace the promise of offshore wind enthusiastically, we definitely need much more information to show that the potential benefit can actually manifest at all and can do so without harming the birds, fish, and marine mammals already facing myriad threats. Thank you so much, Ms. Savage. I have some follow-up questions here in just a bit. We're, just, we're now going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Aylesworth, representing the Natural Resources Defense Council. Ms. Aylesworth, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'd first like to just express my regret that I have to follow Jen Savage. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm Sandy Aylesworth with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I'm with the NRDC Oceans Program. I want to thank Senator McGuire for hosting this forum and hearing, and also for so wholeheartedly embracing the idea right off the bat that in order to develop offshore wind, we need to do it in a way that protects the marine environment and factors in other stakeholder uses. California is a leader in climate change mitigation and marine protections, so let's guide with these two principles, elevating them both equally. We can do it. I also just wanted to share that this is the first time I've been um, so far north in California, and it was immediately clear driving in yesterday just how special Humboldt Bay is. NRDC fully recognizes that addressing climate change through dramatic decarbonization is urgently needed. As such, we are, of course, supportive of responsibly cited offshore wind. We've been very active in the Atlantic in promoting it and working with developers to ensure that the highest degree of marine protections are upheld. Today I'm going to discuss some of the environmental considerations building on Chet and Jen's remarks. Um, some of the environmental considerations associated with floating offshore wind and I'd also like to highlight some of the science needs and research priorities that NRDC and other organizations have identified. Could I have the next slide, please? Great.
I'll briefly highlight some environmental considerations associated with floating offshore wind turbines. So hopefully these two images are somewhat instructive. There's concern about habitat loss. There's no denying that these turbines will have some sort of benthic footprint. They have to attach to the seafloor. So where they're placed is very important. They also penetrate all of the water column with very long cables because they use anchoring systems, which is a benefit in some regards. But there is plenty of potential for an all of water interaction with the many cables. There's also concern about secondary entanglement. We're very clear on the fact that the mooring lines have a huge circumference. So there's not tremendous concern about primary direct entanglement from marine mammals interacting with those cables. However, there is a concern that marine debris and fishing gear could become entangled in the very many cables within an offshore floating wind farm. One of the reasons that we're so supportive of starting small and then scaling up developments incrementally is to see how these interactions between sea turtles and marine mammals play out with cables in the field. Siting offshore wind turbines should prioritize avoiding sensitive habitat areas, then requiring strong measures to protect wildlife throughout each stage of the development process. And then there should be comprehensive monitoring of wildlife and habitat before, during, and after construction. Following this framework of avoidance, prioritizing avoidance, is essential for responsibly developing offshore wind energy. Okay, the next slide, please. Thanks. And next one. Thank you. Now I'd like to discuss some of the environmental considerations specific to the Humboldt Call area, which you'll see up there outlined in yellow. On this slide, you'll see, oh, I already said that, the outline of the Humboldt Call area. Um, so it's hard to tell from this image, but one of the concerns that we have is about the benthic communities that live on the seafloor. I mentioned before that it's going to be important to avoid placing anchors in sensitive habitat. And there's limited information about the benthos of the Humboldt Call area. However, in 2016, there was some work um, using an autonomous underwater vehicle, and that characterized some of the seafloor habitat near the Call area. The expedition found 20 species of corals, 8 species of sponges, and 18 species of fish near the Humboldt Call area. This observed diversity and density of species demonstrates that a thorough benthic survey should occur in the call area to identify areas with high levels of diversity in order to minimize benthic impacts. It's also important to note that the call area is situated between two submarine canyons. One is Eel Canyon to the south and the other is Trinidad Canyon to the north. You have about we know. one minute. I Great, apologize. thank you very much. One thing to note about these submarine canyons is that they're well documented to serve as habitats, nurseries, forage areas, refugia, and carbon, sequen carbon sequestration and storage areas. It's unknown how development in proximity to these canyons may affect the canyon's ecosystem functions and the services they provide. That's why starting small and monitoring very carefully is critical. Finally, with regard to marine mammals, there are at least 30 species of marine mammals that live in California coastal waters. Though a detailed analysis for only a small number of those occurring in the offshore wind areas has been conducted. For many of the species with known distributions, the data are not fine enough to make localized decisions. And in the Humboldt Call area, there's certainly a need for better data on blue whales and gray whales, among others, I'm sure. To conclude, I'm going to underscore some of the key research needs, and I can see that my time is up, so I will really conclude quickly. Um, I wanted to, building on um, what Jennifer mentioned about the importance of prioritizing a robust analysis of the existing information that's in the data basin, I also wanted to add that having three years of robust baseline data has a great potential to actually benefit the offshore wind industry. If you have an inadequate baseline, 
that could lead to profound delays in the future. And RDC looks forward to working with the California Coastal Commission, Ocean Protection Council, California Energy Commission, and BOEM to ensure that offshore wind development upholds the highest level of environmental protections. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're grateful to our panel. We'd like to be able to open it up some questions here. Uh, we'd like to be able to go to uh, Ms. Aylesworth first. So talk to us about NRDC's work in the Atlantic. Um, is there ongoing monitoring uh, of what you've seen deployed? Fill us in on that, and that's been an issue that wanted to make sure that we address today. That's a great question. I am not, so here's what I can say about um, our work in the Atlantic. We were instrumental in developing, um, working with a regional planning process, and that is one of the elements of offshore wind planning that we've seen to be really successful. Um, for example, the Rhode Island um, offshore wind development undertook an extensive planning process in which NRDC was very active, and part of that process was identifying important ecological areas. So, some so that offshore wind development was cited with those in mind, and as a result, the permitting for that project went very quickly. Um, another part of our involvement has been working really closely with developers in the protection of the North Atlantic right whale, and after years of negotiations, um, NRDC and two other environmental groups were really proud to announce a collaboration with Vin Vineyard Wind where the developer agreed to certain key mitigation measures, so protecting right whales from the acoustic impacts of geophysical surveys and undertaking key construction activities during periods where the whales were less sensitive. So to summarize about our work in the Northeast, I would say that um, we've been very involved in both um, contributing to the science and also um, advocating strongly to really elevate the scientific, to elevate Citing that factors in scientific considerations. You know, are those mostly floating platforms or are they actually drilled in? Can you just fill They're pile driven. Okay, they're pile yeah. driven in there. Right. Okay. So, in terms of floating turbines, um, there are, there's the project in Scotland and there is no floating project in the United States right now. Got it. No, thank you so much. Um, for the three of you, ongoing monitoring, is that an important? Uh, item that you'd like to be able to see addressed of both fisheries and wildlife? Yes, absolutely. I mean, With, without monitoring, we don't know what's happening. And so given especially the fact that it's such a new technology and that we don't know how well it will work and what the impacts will be, monitoring would be critical. No, thank you so much, Mr. Ogan. So look, uh, Humble Bay, as you said, in our entire, re entire North Coast region uh, is critical uh, for Black Grant. Um, why and uh, also if you could just address that a bit uh, and then if you can also just address ongoing monitoring and if you think that is important to the Audubon Society. Thank you. Um, eelgrass grows throughout the west coast from uh, Kimteen Bay and Baja on up uh, through the whole west coast of North America on up into the uh, Alaska Peninsula. Eelgrass is a primary component uh, for foraging black brant um, they migrate down to Baja, California, and then work their way up the coast through the, uh, in the fall, and work their way up through the coast through the winter time, and then um, up to their breeding grounds on the north slope of Alaska. Uh, there are now populations of black, of uh, Pacific brant that are non-migratory, seem to be hanging around the Ala Alaska Peninsula, and this is a product of uh, global climate change in which uh, the sunlight is now reaching down to the uh, bottoms of the oceans there where the uh, eelgrass gets enough sunlight to be able to produce the energy that the brent need to live. Uh, I see this as an opportunity with having platforms offshore to be able to put monitoring devices on these black brent or a large body bird would easily carry a radio caller that can trans transmit information uh, as to where they are migrating to, where they're migrating from, when they are migrating, uh, elevation of their migration. The uh, collars that have been developed so far that are being used uh, will collect information on the birds while they're moving throughout the ocean and then when they get near a cell phone tower it downloads the information from the last time that that collar was uh, downloaded. Um, 
even to uh, even to downloading some information off some 2G towers off of uh, off of Siberia and Russia. Uh, really? So they're getting information on those. No, that is just but I it's a good opportunity to put instrumentation on these towers to be able to uh, collect and transmit information on these and other species. Absolutely, no, thank you. And I just made a note of that as well. Um, for the three of you, what uh, I heard from two of you is it's important to start, I'm paraphrasing here, important to start formalizing uh, the feedback loop, uh, especially the closer we get to leases. So we may see leases in 2020, 2021, right, somewhere in that range. And what I'm hearing is that it would be f uh, important to formalize the feedback loop from stakeholders, whether it's environmental organizations, fishery groups, uh, as these leases are getting closer to uh, uh, being formalized. Please jump in. Yeah, I, would I would say that's absolutely correct. And I mean, this hearing today has been so instructive in the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Um, I, as I said, I think there's a, a bit of a disconnect uh, where we have on one hand this, you know, we're going, we have to build, like we need renewable energy, like we absolutely do, there's sure. no question about it. Um, but there is this sort of pitch to the local community about like we're going to put in this offshore wind farm, it's going to create a gazillion jobs, it's going to solve all our problems, it's wonderful. And maybe that's all true, but we don't really have all the information that we need yet. And Yes, there's been 80 meetings, but a lot of those meetings have been essentially the same thing. And it, so, you know, that it's not like that information is necessarily new or that it's getting to new people or that the um, people who are leaving have as much of an understanding and overview about what else is needed. I mean, I feel like I've learned just, like I said, so much today. I really appreciate this and appreciate the other panelists. Um, you know, so in making a feedback loop that is more formal, more structured. Uh, you can ideally get everybody on the same page, which I don't think we are now. And again, like we support renewable energy. I wanna just be really clear about that. We just want it all to, all the information to be upfront and available to everybody in the public. Look, we need a balanced approach, right? Yeah. Uh, we can't sacrifice one for the other. And by the way, the reason why we're moving forward with renewable energy is uh, for the planet, right? And so we have to be able to have uh, forward thinking and mitigation uh, once we see deployment, please. Sure, and just adding to Jen's comments, um, it's really important to, to note that California has experience in at least um, elevating environmental considerations and other stakeholder concerns. So there was the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan process that went on for over a decade um, and is still in place. Um, and there it was also the San Joaquin Solar Siting Project wherein least conflict areas for development were developed in a six month time frame. So I think going back to what Jen just said, it seems like there is agreement that this sort of process is necessary, one that includes lots of stakeholders, one that prioritizes environmental concerns and those of other stakeholders. And so it's getting down to brass tacks and sort of figuring out what, who's gonna pay for it, who's going to convene it, and who should participate. But again, given California's experience, I think that's eminently doable. It just needs to happen and needs to become a priority. Thank you so much. We're gonna offer uh, very brief closing comments, anything that I may have missed uh, or any items that you would like to be able to advance. We'll start uh, to my right, work our way down to our left. Start with Sandy, please. Uh, any closing comments that you'd like to be able to advance briefly? I don't think I have anything to add other than, um, again, I just really wanted to thank you for advancing oh, this conversation. Good. Thank you so much for being here and super helpful. Uh, in regards to talking about where you've been in the Atlantic as far as the NRDC, uh, and then also how we need to be able to formalize the process. Thank you so much. Please, Ms. Savage. Sure. Uh, I don't have too much to add, but I would just say that as a longtime North Coast resident and somebody who went through the Marine Life Protection Act process, um, I think that it is very clear that when uh, um, the state agencies are working on projects in the North Coast that they need to make a very dedicated and determined effort to understand the particular and unique needs of this area and address them. And Thank I appreciate your efforts in that, that world. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much for being here. Chet? Yeah, I see this as an opportunity now with uh, 
five to ten years down the road before we re really see a developing offshore wind farm to start doing off do start doing the research offshore on some of these pelagic species that are out there and finding out getting a baseline on what's out there and then once the uh, once the platforms are established then to be able to continue that find out uh, more information on what the species are using uh, current technology cameras and so on like that to check the species and then uh, begin to look at the uh, final results of that and I think uh, um, working with Schatz Energy and their program on, on uh, looking at some of the uh, offshore species is a good chance to also work with them. Chit, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to our environmental panel and say thank you so much. Thank you for your time. We're grateful. Again, we are trying to be able to present a well-rounded hearing here today, hearing from agencies and the industry, the environmental organizations, and now we're welcoming uh, the fleet to be able to come forward. Our last panel uh, is titled California's Fisheries and Offshore Wind en Energy. Can wind and fish coexist or will the plan flounder? Um, so we'd like to be able to welcome, uh, and I don't know if anyone noticed the pun, but you're very welcome. Uh, on a Friday. We are going to welcome three individuals uh, here to the table. Uh, first and foremost, we are going to be uh, hearing from Harrison Ibach. He's the president of the Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association. We're then going to hear from Noah Oppenheim, the executive director of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. And we're really grateful that Annie Hawkins is here. She's the executive director of Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. So we're going to start with Harrison, work our way down to my right, uh, and we welcome the three of you to the forum. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Mr. Ibach, you have five minutes. The floor is yours, and I'll give you a 30-second prompt. Thank you, Senator McGuire. Uh, my name is Harrison Ibach. I am the president of Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association. <clears throat> the concept of offshore wind energy is not new in other parts of the world. It is not new on the east coast of the United States, but the concept is new to the west coast, and especially here in California. What is known as the fact that on the west coast of the United States, and in particular California, we have some of the most sustainable fisheries in the world. Here, fishermen face many challenges as our fisheries are some of the most highly regulated with gear restrictions and limited fishing seasons. But notably, there are also a large amount of areas that are already closed to fishing that exists in this state. We have marine protected areas, rockfish conservation areas, essential fish habitat, marine sanctuaries, cow cod conservation areas, and a wide variety of other areas already closed to fishing. If one were to look at a map, it is quite simple to see that the entire state is littered with large areas that are already closed to fishing. These offshore wind energy projects will permanently take away an additional hundreds of square miles of ocean from fishermen as we are unable to fish within these vast areas. This condenses and shifts more fishing effort into the ever-increasing smaller areas that remain. We as fishermen in this state utilize every last bit of these remaining areas. The bottom line is that we cannot afford to lose any more essential fishing grounds. Fishermen are also worried about a long list of potential envir environmental impacts, most of which that have already been mentioned the previous panel. We understand firsthand how harsh and unforgiving the ocean can be and are concerned about failures with the equipment or even the entire project in general. There's also an element of apprehension about the amount of electricity being generated and its effects on the marine environment. The offshore wind project also raises many safety concerns. The proposed site for a wind farm in Eureka is going to take away prime fishing grounds that are critical to obtain due to these close, due to be, being so close to proximity to port. It is also important to retain these local grounds to reduce travel time and bad weather that fishermen often face in Northern California. There are also navigational concerns. Here in Eureka, fishermen must contend with a very dangerous bar to transit to and from the ocean. Increasing the amount of consistent traffic with very large maintenance vessels in a narrow area adds another element of risk to safely pass. Not only the bar, but the fleet must also be careful transiting through the wind farm as there will now be many large obstructions we must avoid and dodge. It will also increase traffic in areas with ships traveling the coast. These are more hazards that a fisherman must face to provide a product that the public desires. 
Wild sustainably caught seafood is considered to be the absolute best form of seafood on the planet. That we, as fishermen, strive to make these viable resources available. Yet it really seems that we are always under attack. Whether it's environmental groups that fight to shut down these fisheries, or government agencies attempting to take away more fishing grounds, fishermen are always fighting to defend their livelihoods. The public relies on us to provide a wild, sustainable product by means of fishing, and we rely on fishing for survival. Fishermen are not against renewable energy at all, but we are against permanently losing fishing opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Adlock. Very grateful. We're now going to turn the floor over to Noah Oppenheim, the Executive Director of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. Noah, welcome, sir. Thank you, Chair McGuire. It's a pleasure to be here with you. The state of California and the people of the North and the Central Coast have a lot to be proud of in their commercial fishermen and women. Our fisheries are among the most sustainable in the world, and our fishermen work tirelessly to ensure that the public trust resources that you, the people, rightly own. They are of the highest quality, their revenues from their harvest are shared for the public's benefit, and their bounty is available to future generations of fishermen and the public forever. And the economic activity of our members and associated seafood businesses, in addition to feeding the state and the world, provide 124,800 jobs at last count and over $35 billion of economic productivity. That's in California alone, according to a Department of Commerce study. Clearly, fisheries are an important part of our coastal renewable economy in California, and threats to these existing jobs and the families they support should be freely discussed in forums like this. So thank you for the opportunity. Our state likewise takes pride in its ingenuity and the proactive work that we take to reduce carbon emissions. But we also take pride in social justice and the equitability of our major projects and initiatives. This has become a renewed focus of the Newsom administration in, for example, the distribution of our scarce water resources. And for that, we're grateful. It's in the spirit of, that, of, of equitability that the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations has been working proactively to defend the rights of our members and operate uh, and apply their craft in the context of wind energy development offshore. The state and the North Coast regions uh, and the Central Coast regions are poised to enter the brave new world of offshore wind energy. If we don't take care, if we don't learn from the mistakes made in other parts of the U.S. and other countries, we will lose a real opportunity to get this right the first time. Climate change and ocean warming impacts to fisheries have been numerous and significant already. From shifting fish population distributions to closures caused by harmful algal blooms, these changes have been unpredictable and sometimes extraordinarily costly, even tragic. In addition to these climate impacts, regulatory and spatial constraints have severely constrained commercial fisheries, costing our members dearly. The impacts to commercial fishing industry resulting from the development of offshore wind resources are likewise numerous and significant, from spatial displacement to gear concentration to business disruption and interruption to impacts to safety, transit, and logistical impacts to shoreside operations. From the fishing industry's perspective, offshore wind development is equivalent to eminent domain. It's crystal clear to us that the fishing industry, that offshore wind area uh, development equates to closed areas. This, the, the beneficiaries of these closures will be corporate entities, foreign and domestic, who sell power to consumers for profit. It's the transfer of assets and resources from one space-intensive ocean user group to another, pure and simple. This is the set of trade-offs like any other eminent domain process. It's a choice for society and for our leaders to make. Let's make wise choices. It's also clear to us that these call areas be cons being considered here today are just the beginning. 30 gigawatts of generation and the resultant displacement of most commercial fishing activity off our coast appear to be the goalpost we're con contemplating here today. That's frightening to many. We hear a lot about compensation to fishermen in, the, in these conversations. Disruption payments to impacted businesses will certainly be appropriate down the road if wind projects and cables are installed in the US EEZ in our coastal waters. But we have a lot of work to do first. If offshore wind projects are not appropriate for certain areas of the coast based on impacts to fisheries or under the CZMA consistency process, we and the wind industry need to know this before leasing takes place. The Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act and the National Environmental Policy Act are two broad legal frameworks that require significant analyses of wind development impacts to commercial fisheries, among others. But because Bowen maintains that it is not reasonably foreseeable that wind development will result from wind energy leasing, the full environmental scoping process, including economic analyses, will not take place until after tens of millions of dollars have been poured into purchasing leases and engineering studies 
This is backwards, in my opinion. The fishing industry knows what these impacts are. There will not be fishing in wind energy areas. We can begin this scoping process now, and we're grateful that after years of advocacy, we are starting to see the foundations of economic studies taking shape. We need to look beyond single studies and focus on developing consortia to address specific questions. Fishing communities and wind developers are starting to engage, tackle these information challenges on the East Coast, and we could take a page from their book here. We also need to scope the indirect impacts to commercial fisheries appropriately. There are many scientific questions that remain unanswered that must be answered by agencies and developers before we install these facilities. We need to know whether floating wind structures aggregate fish stocks, result reducing access and fisheries productivity. We need to know what the loss of federal fish population survey stations will mean for our stock assessments and what management constraints we can expect from uncertainty being injected into the federal management process. We need to know about impacts to radar and other navigation tools. We need to know not only about what impacts these projects would have to sensitive and ESA listed species, but what those impacts could mean for commercial fisheries that those same species already constrain. We are heartened to hear that the state agencies working on this process are already working on many of these scoping questions, and our industry will be a good faith partner in these efforts. We have a lot of pride and faith in California's CZMA consistency process, and we will not accept federal rollbacks of our Coastal Commission's authority to enforce the Coastal Act. 30 seconds. We are obviously, uh, we all obviously have a lot of work to do to get this right, and I look forward to working with you, Senator, and many of those here in the room as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Evan. I'm very grateful. We'll have some uh, follow-up in just a bit. We're uh, so appreciative that Annie Hawkins is here. She's the Executive Director of the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. Ms. Hawkins, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, and I'll give you a 30-second prompt. Welcome. Thank you, and thanks so much for inviting me to beautiful Eureka. It's a nice uh, diversion for me from the usual D.C. life in the East Coast, so hey, I really there appreciate we go. it. The weather's like this every day. <laughs> hey, there we go. I've been here before. Hey, there I know, we I know go. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my name is Annie Hawkins, and I'm the executive director of the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, or RODA, which is based in Washington, D.C. RODA is a membership-based coalition of fishing industry associations and fishing companies with an interest in improving the compatibility of new offshore development with their businesses. And we currently have members from Maine to North Carolina. Um, we provide a strength in numbers approach to coordinating science and policy initiatives to minimize conflicts between traditional and historic fishing and other uses of the Outer Continental Shelf, which as we know are, are increasing rapidly. Um, in today's testimony, I'm gonna focus primarily on the offshore wind leasing process. Um, I'm happy to provide more information on the environmental impacts, but the last panel covered that well. Um, and I did submit a letter for the record um, that we, uh, showing some of our concerns with environmental impacts. One of the biggest obstacles Rhoda has attempted to overcome is the lack of information and incorrect information about offshore development plans and the effects that they may or may not have on fisheries and ocean ecosystems. To be clear, in many ways, offshore wind energy development and sustainable commercial fishing are directly conflicting activities. Unfortunately, on the East Coast, the rapid pace of offshore wind development and the failure to engage in transparent and early engagement with fishing communities has led to leasing and project design decisions being made without effectively minimizing impacts to our historic sustainable commercial fisheries. Proper consideration of fishing practices and management takes a significant amount of time. Often fishermen and regulators are being asked to provide information for purposes and on spatial scales that have never had management relevance before. So these data collection and analytical activities can take months or even years to get right. The opportunities for public input in the leasing process alone do not occur often enough or early enough to allow for meaningful cooperation to reduce conflicts. Fishermen must never be seen as merely a stakeholder in the offshore wind leasing process. Um, if anything, offshore wind developers are simply the newest stakeholders to our into California centuries old fishing industry, which provides the state with weights, traditional ecological knowledge, and a significant contribution to the state's very identity. So Rhoda formed last summer to better amplify the concerns of commercial fishermen and to better include their expansive knowledge into offshore wind development processes. And in some ways, we've found pretty receptive audiences. Um, to that end, we recently signed a 10-year memorandum of understanding with National Marine Fisheries Service and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management um, to communicate fisheries input better into the leasing process and to work on scientific products to better consider fisheries impacts. Um, so through that MOU, we've been able to work more closely alongside our government partners more often in the process um, to enable us to educate our fishing industry membership project development and to provide feedback to both NIMS and BOEM regarding the industry's concerns. 
We've also found it useful to work with wind energy developers directly. Um, we've invited current leaseholding developers to a joint industry task force that we've formed on the East Coast to tackle some of the most difficult conflict areas between the two industries. Working directly together um, will help identify best practices for offshore wind pro projects and provide a forum to drive innovative problem solving. Um, the state and California leaseholders should embrace this collaborative approach as well. Um, we find that there's a lot of room for innovation when people actually talk about what's happening on the water that might not come out through the, through the uh, leasing process. Uh, a couple of the panels have spoken to mitigation. Um, on the East Coast, aggressive state renewable energy procurement goals uh, drive the offshore wind markets, which is a little different from here, I understand. Um, and it, that opens the door to variable approaches to mitigation and to disruption payments um, among projects and among areas. These discussions, first and foremost, need to be transparent and inclusive. It is absolutely imperative that fisheries mitigation follows a stepwise approach. First, to avoid impacts to the extent possible. Second, to minimize any impacts that absolutely can't be avoided. Then to mitigate any residual impacts through appropriate spatial, seasonal, or technological controls and then, and only then, once those steps have been followed, consider disruption payments for fisheries losses. Since the beginning of offshore wind development projects, there's been the recognition of the need for a regional science body to address research and monitoring needs for fisheries and offshore wind interactions, not just on a project-specific level, but to understand ecosystem impacts from the large-scale installation of these new industrial projects, as well as the cumulative impacts of multiple lease sites. Um, the relationship that Rhoda has built with government agencies and offshore wind energy developers has allowed us to assist in the formation of a new 501c3, the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, or ROSA, which is affiliated, um, which is a collaborative effort among fishing industry representatives, offshore wind developers, and state and federal government agencies. We're working to increase salient and credible data on fisheries and wind development and to increase the understanding of the effects of wind energy development on fisheries and the ocean ecosystems on which they depend. 30 seconds. Okay. California must similarly develop and support collaborative initiatives to increase scientific understanding, research, and monitoring, which is paramount to achieving future coexistence. We founded Rhoda on the hope to minimize the divide and conquer approach to interacting with commercial fishermen in a rapidly developing ocean. Our successes have come from our ability to collaborate with fishermen and fishing related businesses that will be affected by wind energy. Fishermen hold a broad range of beliefs and approaches to their interactions with other ocean users, but they're also the single best source of information about the offshore environment. This information has to be brought to bear in a constructive and time appropriate manner in order to ensure that one renewable resource isn't developed at the expense of another. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice work. Really grateful. Would like to be able to open it up for questions if it works for the three of you. Would like to be able to start with Mr. Abach. Tell us about, uh, you know, we heard that the, the association has an MOU uh, with Principal Power. Don't want to necessarily get into the exact details of the MOU, but what are you trying to be able to accomplish to be able to protect the fleet? Um, <clears throat> well, I've always liked that saying, uh, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. Yeah. But I think that when it comes to offshore wind energy with commercial fishermen, uh, we are trying to make it so that we do have a seat at the table, but we are always going to be on the menu. Yeah. And you talked about losing valuable ground, right, uh, that would otherwise uh, be utilized for commercial fishing. If, do you want to talk about any of the other specific concerns to Humboldt? Um, that we should be aware of, that we should be looking at as we move forward? Well, I mean, like I had stated in, uh, in my testimony, uh, there's so many closures already in California. Mm -hmm. We have just been bottlenecked into all of these other confined areas. Mm -hmm. And if we take away more grounds, hundreds of square miles of area, I mean, all we're doing is pushing us further and further and condensing us where it's effort shift into smaller and smaller areas. So all of our ground is very valuable. It doesn't matter if we were to move it to the north or move it to the south. The bottom line is that we can't afford to lose any more grounds, period. The challenge is, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is the cumulative impact of what you've seen over the past many years with uh, closures, with um, uh, areas that are now off limits, et cetera. Is that, would that be accurate? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. We'd like to be able to go to Ms. Hawkins. Uh, can you give us a rundown of best practices that you've heard of, that you've seen, and that you've implemented? Um, and then any lessons learned that would be good for all of us to hear about, especially as we go forward with this burgeoning industry? Sure. So in terms of best practices, it's um, I can't necessarily give you a rundown because we're still working on them. I mean, we, sure. there's still a lot of ways to go, right? Um, but Low-hanging fruit. <laughs> yeah. 
Sure. Um, I mean, like I said, it's, it's getting the industries together. It's getting the fishing industry to the table early and often, and not just to check a box, not just, you know, we've, we've, I heard here today, you know, we've had 80 meetings, and we've heard on these because we've had 150 meetings on this project. But if fishermen don't know where, where their input is best given into the process, they're not gonna bring that information effectively. Um, and a lot of it has to be driven by the fishing industry. This should not ever feel like something that's being imposed on one industry by another, if the, true, if the goal truly is to, to work together um, and to really you know, coexist or, or, or be more compatible. Um, so I would say you know, s start everything early. Start your economics impacts studies early. Start your ecological surveys early. You know, now, if you, if you know what's coming now, start working on it now um, and don't wait until you know you've got these short deadlines with a with a permitting process you mentioned thank you uh, you mentioned uh, there were some conflict areas uh, that had started to evolve what can we learn here in the golden state about what you're seeing as conflicts back east well, I can I mean there's a lot of specific ones and sort of more general ones I mean one one thing that comes to mind that that's really obvious one is that the first few um, leases that were issued on the East Coast were issued without any consideration of fishing vessel transit so even if you assume that the area is going to be a closure to fishing you know you have people that are going to fishing grounds on other on the other side how are they going to get through that array and and in New England, we have a 1,400 square mile complex now of leases that just keep glomming onto each other. You know, for a fisherman on a lobster boat to cross 1,400 square miles is, is no joke, right? Um, but once the developer holds the lease and has developed their, um, their, their pricing and signed their procurement contracts with the state, um, it becomes very difficult for them to remove rows of turbines to allow for fishing vessel access. That should have been written into the lease. That should have been done up front. And now we're starting to learn that that's the type of thing that you can look up up front. And there's a lot of other examples like that, but that's, that's a pretty good one. That's a, thank you. Really valuable feedback on that. We'd like to be able to go to Mr. Oppenheim. Um, talk to us about how you would like to be able to see a formal process develop uh, that would include the fleet uh, here in the months and years to come. That's a critically important question, obviously. The, I, I think engagement with the, um, the OPC, the Ocean Protection Council, and the Coastal Commission are the places to start. I think we, we need to start uh, taking the initiative here in California, um, start, having, start creating a forum for conversations with the, the developers, the wind industry, um, who also are seeking certainty in this space. I, I completely understand that. Um, that. That's the model. It's clearly the one that's uh, demonstrating the greatest degree of success on the East Coast. Um, and we are, we're taking the baby steps now. But w without question, our organization, the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, the local associations closest in proximity to the wind energy call areas, and other associations of fishermen, who do operate in these areas as well need to be at the table. We've started on our industry side to have those conversations. They'll continue, um, and and we will continue to maintain this dialogue. We heard feedback, uh, and we're going to have to wrap it up because we want to make sure that we provide time for folks to be able to provide comment as well. We've heard feedback about ongoing monitoring and the importance of that uh, and being able to have real-time feedback if um, we have challenges. How important that is, is that to the three of you um, as, w as far as the ongoing monitoring and communication with the fleet and being able to build that into any agreements? Uh, I'll start with uh, Harrison and work our way down to Andy. Um, I just think it's crucially important that over this process for the next, oh, as it was stated, maybe five years, um, that the fleet really has a say in, in how this is done, and we really hope that this is done right for a magnitude of reasons, not just for fisheries, but also for environmental impact as well. Uh, I don't want to say we only have one shot of getting this right, but it really seems as though we really do only have one shot of getting this right. And so I really hope that um, there's further dialogue and a lot more discussion moving forward with uh, as we go through this process. Thank you so much. Noah? Harrison's comments. Um, monitoring is critically important. We need to set baselines now. Those include economic baselines, human use baselines. Um, but we can't 
do monitoring in the sense of learning from mistakes and, and pulling back from the brink, so to speak, if it's an all or nothing proposition with respect to development. Um, I'd love to see the state take a real interest in iterative approaches, um, whether that be some sort of smaller scale operational implementation, um, putting 10 turbines in the water instead of 100 to start, monitoring the situation there, mm -hmm. and then determining whether or not these projects are appropriate or if there are any anticipa unanticipated impacts. Uh, a pilot project, if you will, or something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And yeah. I would echo everything they said. Um, you know, monitoring is critically important, but it's only monitoring is only valuable if you have the correct building blocks on either side. One is that you know, if you're monitoring and you see an impact or you see an effect that maybe you didn't anticipate or maybe is worse than you thought, what do you do about it? And so, unless you have an action plan from what comes out of the monitoring, the monitoring it of itself isn't very helpful. And you also need to be able to effectively monitor. You need baseline information, and that in terms of fisheries takes a long time to get and you know one or two year time series of what's going on in, in these spatial areas is not going to tell you what you need to know 30 years from now to see what changed and so you need to get started on those types of studies and designing those research needs as soon as, as, soon as possible. Has there been, uh, in my ignorance and I apologize, has there been compensation for loss of fishing ground anywhere else? Fishing gear? Uh, no, anywhere else in the world or on the east coast has there been discussion about that, a compensation for the fleet? There have been payments made um, in, in Europe. So in, in the UK, fishing is allowed in wind energy areas. In the rest of Europe, it's not. And so in the rest of Europe, it was very easy to sort of nationally decide what to do with, with fishing with fishermen who are displaced, right? Because you, you know they're moving. Um, in the UK, there were payments. On the East Coast, there's payments in discussion. I'm, I, wouldn't know if any checks have been cut, but, um, but yes. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those discussions happen early in the process um, before any impacts are minimized, and that isn't a good way to keep people fishing. That's, that's a good way to, to pay off people that, that would like to retire anyway. Um, doesn't, doesn't do much for training new fishermen and keeping s fisheries sustainable. And we'll follow up on this as well, but Ms. Hawkins, I don't mean to uh, pepper you with 20 questions, so thank Go you ahead. for your patience. <laughs> so why the, the, scrap, the, the difference between Great Britain and then the rest of Europe of allowing fishing around wind turbines and then uh, off limits elsewhere. It has something to do with the Magna Carta and public trust rights in the UK and it just- Good times. Yeah. <laughs> that's, right. that's enough for, for today, right? All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's something we'll follow up on in, uh, on that. Have you heard of any conflicts though with wind industry and uh, the fleet though uh, of being able to fish around uh, turbines? Has there been any challenges? A, a lot of challenges, a lot. All right, we'll definitely follow up on that. Thank you so much. We're going to look to closing comments briefly, please. We're going to start with Ms. Hawkins, then Mr. Oppenheim, then Mr. Eibach, please. I just want to thank you again for, for bringing me here, and I'm happy to be a resource anytime that I can provide more information to the community or to the city or to anyone um, working on this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very briefly, uh, thank you for creating this forum, for allowing the industry to ha have a spot at the table. Um, and uh, without question, we, we need strong, wise leadership in the future. So we'll be looking to you and to the committee for that. And um, I will just add that we, we have an extraordinary opportunity here to learn from mistakes. The, the state agency staff who we've spoken with recently are up to the task, and we look forward to supporting their work. Thank you so much. Mr. Abel. Um, I just want to let it be known that if anyone would like to have any further discussion regarding any of this, I'm always open and available. Otherwise, thank you very much, Senator, for yeah. allowing us to speak. Absolutely. And, and I promise you we'll be following up with each and every one of you. Uh, we want to take a moment to say thank you to our panel. Let's give a round of applause, please. And ladies and gentlemen, Hawkins gets the award for traveling the furthest. So uh, thank you so much for coming uh, all the way from the East Coast. Now we'd like to be able to open it up um, for public comment. Uh, we're gonna start out, uh, and again, wanna say thank you to the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. We'd like to be able to have their executive director to be able to come forward uh, who will lead us off in public comment. Uh, each individual who will be speaking it will have uh, two minutes to be able to address the committee. Uh, and on behalf of the committee, we wanna say thank you for hanging with us uh, and hanging with us 
uh, for the morning and now into the afternoon. Uh, we're welcoming uh, Matthew Marshall, who's the executive director of the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, have been real leaders here on the North Coast on the issue of wind energy. We welcome you, sir, and want to say how much we appreciate your work. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, and I'll, and I'll be brief. Um, for those that aren't familiar, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority is a local government joint powers agency here in Humboldt County, and our mission is to develop sustainable energy initiatives on behalf of the county and all of our uh, member cities uh, and we are also responsible through community choice segregation for the electricity supply part of uh, electricity service here. So we're, we're responsible for procuring the power that, that, that powers Humboldt County. Um, and so as part of that, you know, we're obviously interested in moving towards the state goals and our local goals of 100% uh, renewable power. And offshore wind is a, is a huge potential there. And so to, to your point, you know, I think we're also, as a local public agency, very committed to not wanting to have our power be at the expense of, you know, unacceptable impacts to environmental or fishing, uh, you know, concerns. And so I think, you know, our proactive approach has been really to not be sort of passive and hope that this moves forward in a way that our community finds acceptable and that addresses environmental and fishing concerns. And so, you know, my board has really, um, I think, been uh, bold in saying we want to get in front of this and we don't want to just, you know, hope we get a lucky developer that really cares about these things as much as we do. And so that's why we've been very active in trying to, to get in front of it and, and move this forward with really a community-driven process with environmental concerns and the fishing community and the, the entire community with a true seat at the table in the decision making and not being in a responsive reactive mode. And so we're, we're looking forward to kind of continuing that process and you know we have to work within the framework of the BOEM process and, and obviously of course the, the state environmental uh, regulatory process, um, but we're we're eager to move that forward, and we appreciate you having this event up here in Humboldt County and not in Sacramento. And you know, and we look forward to kind of continuing the local dialogue and really having this conversation here in our community as this moves forward. So, thank you. No, thank you so much. And our CEA uh, has really set the standard, so do appreciate that, sir. And please pass on our thanks to your board as well. We'd like to be able to bring forward uh, individuals who now would like to be able to speak. We're going to queue up right over here near the microphone. If you don't mind just giving us your first name and if you are with an organization, your organization. Thank you again for being with us. You have two minutes, please. Uh, uh, Dennis Mayo, McKinleyville. Before I start, I'd like to tell the community that I'd, uh, we, we need to have our thoughts and prayers for McKinleyville yeah, uh, High School please, today. Yeah. We, we had a, a young person that seems... Uh, committed suicide and so the schools closed and uh, all of our our prayers should go out to the the, the children there the family it's just a real bad deal so it, thank you for indulging me in that no thank you so much sir. Okay, uh, I'm Dennis Mayo and uh, wear many hats uh, you said I was from McKinleyville Community Services District which is correct and we are a member of this energy deal so I have that hat that I wear uh, also I worked on uh, drilling rigs all over the country. I worked on these platforms that float and don't float. So uh, I don't have a negative opinion about that. And I also support uh, alternate energy, but also support that we need to use our natural gas, which is fluent. And I know we'll have a lot of disagreement about that, but that needs to be one of the uh, tools that we have in our toolbox. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, all of these things sound really good in the halls of legislature and on paper, but when they come down to those of us that actually produce, it's a different scenario. Uh, it, it really, um, so anyway, let me, let me cut to the chase. I, I, I represent California commercial beach fishermen, okay? These guys surf fish, but they also are local crabbers. They're hook and line fishermen. They're the guys that produce this great sustainable product that we need. We don't get the we don't get the support we need from our state, and I know you reach out to us, Mike. We're having discussions right now about the crab closure, the ridiculous crab crab closure. So every one of these things that happen, look out. Uh, it's going to be good. Uh, uh, these guys will protect us. We don't trust none of that because it's not the, not been our history. The MPAs that are out there have cut out a huge portion of our fishing unnecessarily this whole region is an MPA practically put these things on land or put them in the MPAs which are just research areas anyway they're not they're, they're not they're designed to produce fishing for us um, a lot of other things that will communicate and writing with you uh, I know this is gonna happen okay we, we're not stupid but we're just trying to figure out which eye we want you to gouge out 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your comments, and thank you for being here, and thank you for leading off uh, on that recognition as well and the tragedy in McKinleyville this morning. Yeah, well, that, yeah. No, it is. It is. Thank you so much. Sir, we welcome you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tyler Studs. I'm with EDP Renewables. Uh, I lead um, the project manager for the Redwood Coast Offshore Wind Project. Um, I bring to that uh, about 10 years' experience in the offshore wind industry, including eight with the state of Massachusetts, uh, leading the state's investment in multi-year, multi-million dollar baseline wildlife surveys. Uh, the three points I want to make are, number one, to speak directly to the question posed in this panel. Um, I do believe that offshore wind, wildlife, and fisheries are compatible. You know, we're committed to making that actually be, uh, be a yes. Um, I do believe that there are very good lessons learned, but that each project is unique, and those lessons learned are more in the process of how we create that than in the science findings themselves. Uh, the third point is that you know, we are, I believe that we are on the right track. Um, so in terms of lessons learned in processes, um, I echo what's been shared by many of the panelists already, and credit you for putting together a phenomenal panel, uh, multiple panels. In the process, it's key, obviously, to be engaged early and often with you know, all of the key stakeholders, jointly scoping and identifying key research questions is critically important, both on the fisheries level and on with, uh, with wildlife um, advocates and, and nonprofits. Um, we are, as an industry, engaging early right now with um, key environmental um, Aiden, or excuse me, environmental non nonprofits mm -hmm. to you know, identify how we can together jointly scope those process, jointly scope those questions, and implement those. So I will lastly just advocate you know that this it's critically important that the state make investments uh, in pr you know conducting you know early baseline wildlife surveys, being able to deal with existing data already to analyze those in the context of uh, offshore wind, um, and that you know we do that you know, in a very high priority way. So um, I really appreciate this opportunity to provide comments and thank you very much again for no, providing. Tyler, thank you so much. We're yeah. gonna have uh, Taylor or Carlene get your card as well uh, before you leave, thank you so much. I know Tom has your contact, contact information as well. Good morning, actually good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, do apologize uh, for the wait. Thank you for hanging with us. The floor is yours, ma'am. If you could just give us your first name. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Shirley Laos, Government Affairs Coordinator and Tribal Member at Trinidad Rancheria. Thank you for being and, here. And um, Trinidad has been a, a founding member of the, the state BOEM uh, task force. And so the um, early engagement um, you know, was conducted with tribes. And um, I just want to say, like everybody else has said today, early and qualitative engagement is critical. And um, everything is connected and everything needs balance. And at Trinidad Rancheria, we own and operate uh, Trinidad Harbor. And so we work closely with the, fish, the local fishermen that fish out of Trinidad. And we also own a crab boat. So we're directly impacted with um, many aspects of the discussions that are happening today. So we're uh, following this process and uh, we're actively engaged. And I just want to uh, put in um, a plug for uh, TEK, the Tribal um, Ecological Knowledge, and that that isn't forgotten or not included when you're looking at the scientific um, information aspect. Thank you. Ms. Laos, thank you so much. Uh, really grateful that you're here and providing that perspective, and you left out that you make damn good chowder at Seascape. So uh, it's uh, really good, but uh, thank you very much, and please pass on our uh, thanks to the board as well. Thank you so much. It's good to see you, and thanks for being here. Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for hanging with us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Senator McGuire. I appreciate us having this meeting in the first place. Yeah. Uh, my name is Suzanne Atia. I'm an ambassador for the California Coastal National Monument System based out of Trinidad uh, with association, um, in association with the BLM, the Trinidad Museum, and the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust. <coughs> In the spirit of saving what was left of our great redwoods, we have to be careful not to give away what we can't get back. I'd like to speak for those who have no voice and are, no, and are not at this meeting right now. The albatross, the mirrorlets, the puffins, frigate birds, terns, pelicans, and so many others, some of which circumnavigate the globe with their ancient and historic flights. Wind farms are currently decimating birds and bats uh, mitigation and avoidance are not 
currently successful on land. Why should we think it will be offshore? A local subspecies of bat will become extinct within the next 10 years due to land-based wind energy. Uh, it, is a current on, it is a current ongoing problem which has not been solved. The birds may be out of sight, but, not, but do not let them be out of mind. They depend on us to protect them. That's it. Thank you. So, T, thank you so much, and thank you for being here today. We're grateful for your comments and for your testimony and have taken notes on them. Well, good afternoon. It's good to see you, sir. Welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for providing this opportunity today. Uh, my name is Dave Bitts. I'm a local crab and salmon fisherman. I actually fish salmon uh, as far south as uh, Pfeiffer's. Um, I want to thank, um, uh, I want to talk about the, the business of involving the fishing community early in the discussions. And I want to thank RCA EA for doing that to the extent that we've actually signed an MOU with them. I want to thank Principal Power, likewise, for reaching out to fishermen. There are a couple of things that need to be included in that outreach. Uh, and the first is um, the issues of, of transit of the harbor and uh, uh, the footprint of the cable that's going to come ashore. What are the consequences of, of that cable going to be uh, on our fishing grounds, which it must uh, go through? Um, are we going to be able to continue to come and go from Humboldt Bay to fishing grounds at the time of our choosing rather than at someone else's pleasure? That needs to be discussed soon. And the other thing is um, I heard today for the first time that there's an anticipated expansion if this works, to uh, a, a production on the order of 20 gigabytes. Uh, that could be great for the state of California. It could be good for Humboldt Bay. Where is the footprint for that expansion going to be? Uh, presumably, the uh, Humboldt call area and the Morro Bay call area are the best available sites. And we're looking at maybe 200 megawatts from those sites. We're looking at, we, we just heard about a proposed hundredfold expansion of offshore wind production. Uh, huh. I would like to see the energy industry's maps as much as they want to see the fishing industry's maps. And we have to do that before we get much farther with this expansion to 20 gigs. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bits. We're grateful for you here and for your continued work on behalf of the fleet. Thank you so much for coming today. You bet. All right. Good afternoon. Good Thanks afternoon, for attending. It's good Senator. to see you. You have two minutes. My name is Nancy Kirshner Rodriguez, and I am here today representing the Business Network for Offshore Wind. The network, as we like to be called, we're a nonprofit organization solely focused on the development of the U.S. offshore wind industry and the advancement of its supply chain. We um, consider ourselves an authoritative voice for the offshore wind business community. We bring together developers, policymakers, global experts, and we have more than 300 member businesses, including numerous labor unions for critical discussions and unprecedented networking opportunities. We just held our sixth international partnering forum, and uh, many of the speakers here today participated with us and 100% of our resources are focused on the offshore wind um, supply chain development. We try to be an advocate for our members. We're dedicated to building business across sectors into a coherent supply chain that supports domestic wind farms and really establishes the United States as a global competitor in the offshore wind market. Um, we were started in 2012 um, in Maryland, and we have grown um, to a significant number, as I said, across the, the states. Um, obviously, our work here, our work here began in 2016, and I want to thank um, Tom as well. Um, in 2018, we held our Floating Frontiers meeting and produced an environmental um, uh, impacts paper from that, and that is on your website, we appreciate that. We look forward to continuing to work with you. One example that I would just cite is that we have worked a lot with um, the British government and 
we have obtained um, information about their different work with the broadly with the fishing industry and they are very interested in working further with you mm -hmm. on discussions so I would look forward to um, helping us facilitate that as well and we just look forward to being a strong partner in the uh, numerous dialogues and also in the regulatory and legislative process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for traveling to Humboldt as well. We're grateful that you're here. All right, we're gonna welcome you, ma'am. Good afternoon, thank you for hanging with us. It's good to see you. You have two minutes, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, thank you so much for putting together this excellent yeah. um, hearing. And I wanna say I've been to many uh, meetings on this topic and this is by far the most informative I've been to. That's great mostly because of the diversity of voices and interests that have been represented here. Um, I think it's really important to have these types of meetings so that we can all hear the, the concerns of different interest groups. Um, Humble Baykeeper, oh, I forgot to say, my name's Jennifer Kalt, I'm the director of Humble Baykeeper. Thank you, Thank you And um, we're very hopeful that wind energy can help California meet our renewable energy targets um, in large part because we really need to slow down the effects of climate change, which are um, you know, having a, a cumulative of effect on not only marine resources, but the fishing industry. So ocean acidification, toxic algae, sea level rise are all serious problems here in Humboldt Bay. Um, I've been really relieved to hear so much discussion about the need for baseline information to do appropriate siting for this um, project. Um, and then also we really need to have an appropriate scale. And um, Having stakeholder engagement that's meaningful early on has been talked about many, many times by many people, but it's really critical. And um, looking at the, the wide range of um, companies that responded to the call, um, I am really hopeful that our Redwood Coast Energy Authority will have priority um, because they are a board of um, elected officials that represent the local interests. And so we really need input from local experts as well as far, you know, experts from elsewhere. Um, we really need local stakeholders. We need the tribal representatives. Um, we need everybody to be participating in this. And um, certainly we need a lot more information about the resources offshore um, before we launch into this. So uh, as an environmental advocate, I just want to really emphasize the point that we're hopeful that the environmental impact analysis, siting, mitigation, monitoring can all be done as well as possible so that we can actually have a successful renewable energy project here. Thank you. Madam Director, thank you so much. Thanks for coming today and for all your work. Mr. Councilman? Yes, hi. Good yeah, Patrick O'Rourke, I'm a council member at uh, City of Ferndale, but I'm also have been very involved in the Redwood Region Economic Development Commission. And I think this has some great potential for our area for economic development. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, I think we really need to go out and, and look at best practices or people that have gone before us in other parts of the world. I'm sure there are other countries, other companies that are uh, leaders in this area that are known for their best practices, hopefully, or, and or have learned from their mistakes. So I'm hoping that we'll really do that research to be able to bring the best practices before we, before we step in the wrong direction or do leases. We also need to make sure, and I'm sure through the process, it sounds like, again, we've brought some great stakeholders together. Thank you so much for doing that, Senator McGuire, uh, and everyone that has been involved here. I think that's great. Uh, I do hope that we'll mitigate for any uh, waterfowl effects. Uh, for uh, I hope we will also uh, do cover the sustainable concerns of the fishing industry and uh, and their ability to navigate, their ability to uh, continue to uh, create their own livelihood. It's a great industry and I, I hope that can continue. Two other thoughts, uh, real quick ones. Uh, one is um, that we, uh, well, one other basically. If we do go forward, I'm hoping that we take a look at this. Uh, I remember the old internet thing where you started out with a category three or then you went to five and then you went, I'm hoping that if we are, we do have the potential to do a project program like 10 windmills or whatever, and then we're thinking of expanding this along the coast or in whatever areas, that we build the capacity up front if we're gonna make a, a major investment in regards to getting this on shore. Uh, I, I hope we don't skinny on it, but I hope we have the line capacity to really, uh, to really expand out 
so that we don't have to make the investment twice uh, because we need to look at it 40, 50 years out and, and what we can really do with it if it is successful. So thank, thank you for being here. No, thank you so much, Councilman. We're grateful for your testimony today. Thank you for being here and hanging with us. Good afternoon. You've been here since this morning. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. The floor is yours. You have two minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Brad Wilson. I'm a Eureka resident uh, for about 15 years. Um, as a local uh, resident, as a graduate of the renewable or the environmental resources engineering program at HSU, uh, I see the potential of wind energy as a real asset. Um, I'm, I'm an advocate. Uh, this was a brilliant meeting today. Uh, it's all through upfront stakeholder coordination across a wide spectrum that these sorts of things are going to be successful. Um, those things being noted, uh, a wind farm offshore of any size, uh, really as, as locally reported, as confirmed by Larry Odeker, uh, the Harbor District yeah. Commissioner, uh, significant upgrades are required to the port. Uh, before we're really able to do anything offshore. So 100-ton working surfaces, new ports, uh, potentially expanded infrastructure and transmission and distribution, all of those things. Um, the policy table um, brought it up as a potential issue. Uh, the industry table uh, brought it up again um, that oftentimes the legislature or the local government is called upon to kind of overcome some of those initial baseline things to pave the way for industry, to pave the way for a developer to come in. I was originally crafting this as a question to you, but realizing you don't potentially have the ability to respond, I would suppose it's an encouragement for the California legislature to consider the predecessor tasks that require significant funding, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade the infrastructure to even attempt an offshore wind farm. Given that the wind farm is, you know, 10, 15 years out, uh, all these predecessor tasks, uh, the ability to upgrade the port, all of those things need to happen before. And as a way to attract uh, industry to our area, uh, as exampled by cases in Europe. Um, so assuming you don't have the ability to respond, the California legislature is working on anything like that, I would encourage us to consider those things moving forward. No, thank you, Mr. Wilson. And I'll just take a, a brief moment, and I uh, know that we have several speakers, and I'll keep it less than 60 seconds. I think it's uh, it's key that we look at what those potential upfront costs will be for the infrastructure and what it would take to be able to um, develop that, especially in our neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. I think that you're going to have two significant driving costs, one on the ground for the port and the second uh, when it comes to transmission lines. Mm -hmm. um, the state has assisted specific renewable energy on transmission in the past uh, through uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction funds. And that has not even been, been considered on this issue, on this project, let alone across the state for offshore wind. But I promise you it's something that uh, we will take a look at and uh, would love to be able to keep in touch on it if it's OK. Thank you. Thank I you so much, Mr. Wilson. Point. Appreciate that. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Thanks for hanging with us. Thank you, Senator Berguire, and to the Joint Committee for sponsoring a terrific meeting. Like oh, thank you, other sir. Other speakers have said it's been quite valuable. Oh, thank you. My name is Scott Frazier. I'm a consulting wildlife biologist from Blue Lake, California. Early on in the on-land wind development to Hatchby, I was able to work on some of those projects where there was a high degree of trial and error learning. And that is certainly not what we want to see here offshore in a very difficult work environment. So. I think that uh, it's important that the baseline studies occur and the research be done before leases are signed. So I'm here to strenuously agree with and support the comment Noah Oppenheim made about doing that work to know the impacts before the leases are signed is important. And I think the consistency <laughs> determination with the state agencies might be a good venue for that. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to echo Jen Savage's comment about the quality of information and meetings and again, today you've made a really great start on that. But I likewise have been to several meetings, but it's basically the same information we'd heard at the previous ones. The maximum future expansion offshore should be described due to both the fisheries access issues that have been addressed and the environmental impacts that have been discussed earlier. So I think this idea about doing a 10 tower project and then, well, if it works out, we'll do some more is maybe not the way to adequately plan for a project that many people are here to endorse. So mapping the maximum potential now would be important. I'm here to speak for the migratory birds that don't get to vote and other wildlife generally. And I hope they should be given full consideration along with the human economic impacts, including 
fishing and the other uh, livelihoods that people have that concern. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fish. Grateful you're here today. Thanks for hanging with us so long. Good afternoon, ma'am. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, I'm Stephanie Tidwell, Executive Director of Friends of the Yale River, and our organization adamantly, vehemently agrees that we need bold action to draw down our reliance on climate-destroying fossil fuels. That said, we have some serious concerns about the potential impacts of this project. I think in its, its worst-case scenario, uh, these floating offshore wind farms have the potential to cause pretty significant harm to both aquatic and avian life. And I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that there, this is a long-term plan, that people are going into this looking at siting and mitigation very carefully. But I just, I want to put us back in the context of, of this region and the greater Humboldt Bay region and the fact that we are doing so much restoration work right now to save our salmonid species. We're taking out dams, we're doing estuary restoration, and yet our salmon are still struggling. Our, our, our fisheries in general are still struggling and our fishermen are struggling as we deal with things like the, the early closure on crabbing. And so when we start looking at adding in what everyone in this room admits are potentially significant environmental impacts to a region that has historically been a salmon stronghold and that is struggling, you know, I have to question where this fits in our long-term thinking in terms of truly sustainable energy. And I, I look forward to engaging and seeing how this goes, but I do think that we need to really think of in the local context for how are we going to save our salmon and what is the significance of the impacts that this poses to it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony today. And again, thank you for being here with us for so long as well. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ma'am. Welcome. We good look afternoon. forward to your testimony. Yeah, thank good you, afternoon. Senator McGuire and uh, Mr. Wesselow for bringing everyone here together. Uh, my name is Mary Collins. I'm a visiting scholar at the California Institute for Energy and Environment, and I also direct the American Jobs Project. Um, and we recently uh, wrote a report in collaboration. Actually, many people in the room collaborated on this report, um, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, and we looked at this opportunity that we have to build a new industry from the ground up and, and asking how we're going to do this in a way that's going to create win-win solutions for the environment, for fishermen, um, you know, and for labor, uh, really to spark a new wave of innovation in our state. And as I sit here today, I see that we have a lot of work to do. Um, and you know we need to have investment from the state of California so we can do these studies, so we can start to build these processes um, and really create meaningful connections with uh, you know, the UK. That's been brought up today. There's mm -hmm. a lot of great case studies there. Uh, Minister Claire Perry just had her offshore, her, the, the offshore wind sector deal that came out that looks at the supply side and they wanna share information and knowledge with California in a meaningful way. We've got a lot to learn. We also have a lot to potentially offer their industry. Um, so I just want to conclude with the fact that, you know, this is an enormous opportunity to build this new industry from the ground up. Um, and I'd be happy to share case studies that we've been looking at over the years with successes from the offshore wind industry and hope that we can continue this conversation in a meaningful way. Uh, I would love it, Ms. Collins. Thank you so much. And anytime you all want to get together, please let us know. I'd be honored to sit down. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. You have two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Coleman. I am the third division commissioner for the Humble Bay Harbor Recreation and Conservation District and also the community development and resilience director for the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe. So juggling two hats here. Uh, like everyone has said, I could thank you for this, uh, holding this forum and holding it here in Eureka as you're well aware of any kind of development here on the North Coast requires frequent and meaningful stakeholder consultation and engagement. And so I appreciate that, especially with the fishermen, with the tribes, with labor and everyone else here. Uh, there's been a lot addressed here. I agree and believe that any development must be taken carefully with the needs of the current stakeholders in mind, especially with the fishermen, including uh, in port development of which there's the opportunity to do a lot. We have unused infrastructure here that could use an influx of money and an influx of development and jobs. 
but all that needs to be done compatible with the fishing industry and not just not bringing harm but also bringing benefit and i think there's ways that can be done to do that and i just want to end with what hasn't been said and probably everyone considers doesn't doesn't need saying but i still think you know one of our biggest impacts out there is ocean acidification and ocean warming and the only way we're going to have any chance of slowing that down not even reversing it but just slowing down those horrific impacts to the fisheries to life on this planet is to a rapid shift towards renewable energies such as this and so I would just encourage everyone while we're looking at the impacts to the environment to consider the positive impacts also for development such as this and the positive impacts that it could have to our fisheries and the positive impacts that it can just have to the quality of our life in general. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Mr. Coleman. And you're absolutely right. You're spot on uh, in regards to ocean acidification and how challenging it's been. Um, and it's getting worse uh, because of our reliance on fossil fuels. So I'm grateful that you made that point today as well. Thank you so much. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator McGuire. It's good to see Mr. you again. Mr. Westlow, Ken Bates, Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association. Um, my job has been representing fishermen uh, with land use and zoning and planning for since about 1982. Um, I have a couple things to say, some of the things that Noah and um, Harrison touched on. When you talk about the regulations and the amount of closed areas in California, it's tremendous. If one were to take a, to, to, to take a felt pin and start blackening the areas off the California coast where there's restricted areas or closures, most of the coast, coast has got some sort of encumbrance on it. So when, when Noah talks about basically coming in and eminent domaining essentially these fishing areas, this is something that fishermen are extremely conserved, con considered, they're worried about. There's really no place to go. By the same token, fishermen understand that these projects have to go forward. So the trick is to try to find a balance. Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association has about a year's worth of dialogue with a principal power and with our local energy provider through Matthew Marshall here. And so we're slowly moving along. There's lots and lots of work to do. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to touch on is that a lot of people think that these impacts to the fishing fleet, be it displacement in the ocean or displacement on you know, as far as shoreside facilities or something that's going to happen in the far distant future. And that is actually not correct. Um, it starts immediately with planning. And essentially for for Humboldt Bay, it started on the 16th of April. And on that particular date, uh, the Humboldt Bay Harbor District put in a request for a grant to go ahead and look at redesigning Redwood Terminal Number 1, which is a facility that's 100% occupied by the fishing fleet. So these things have to be planned for way ahead of time. Again, the trick is fishermen know these things are coming and to try to minimize the amount of impacts to this industry so that we can survive through this and the entire state can prosper. Thank you. Mr. Bates, thank you so much and thank you for your ongoing advocacy on behalf of the fleet. We now would like to be able to welcome the supervisor uh, to the hearing. Thank you so much, Madam Supervisor, for being uh, with us. Thank you very hearing. much, uh, Senator. Uh, I'm just here to say a huge thank you to you because being on the uh, Redwood Coast Energy Authority uh, representing the county of Humboldt, uh, we have a CCE, a commu uh, Community Choice Energy, uh, which uh, dedicated itself to uh, providing 100% clean power by 2025, not 2045. That's pretty sweet. So we're talking about local clean energy, but also just the concept of everybody talking together is extremely important. And there were a couple of things mentioned. I I'm also on the advisory committee for uh, Bourne, so I'm very well aware of the, project, the process they're going through as well. But um, I would like to say that there were a few things that were said that really struck me. Uh, Jennifer said, doing the right thing the right way. Because we're, we're going in the right direction in all of these, clean energy, also protecting the environment, protecting the fisheries. So we've got a wonderful, wonderful task ahead of us. The challenge is great, but it's very, very exciting. So I really hope we, we continue with these. And I, anything you put together, I'm right there, Senator. Thank you, Madam Senator. Um, also, I think the idea of offshore wind, and, and I'm a great fan of these guys that are, are doing this clean energy. I've been following them in Europe, et cetera. 
but the idea that they are the new stakeholders, I think was a, a really good one mentioned by Anne. Because when a lot of times something is going forward, it's got a lot of energy, it's a big movement, and you say, we need to include the stakeholders, um, and it's kind of like, well, who are the stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Well, they're the stakeholders in our environment, and we need to include them, but we also need to work very closely together. So I just want to say a very big thank you to you and commit myself to working as hard as I can to make sure this works. No, I appreciate that, Madam Supervisor, and you have been, and I know you're going to continue to as well and appreciate your advocacy. Thank you for being here for the entire time as well. Uh, we're grateful for your testimony today. We'd like to be able to announce our last call for public testimony, last call for public testimony. Is there anyone else that would like to be able to address the committee at this time? All right, hearing and seeing none, we'd like to be able to bring it back to committee uh, to be able to have a few closing comments. There's some thank yous that we'd like to be able to advance and then uh, closing comments. First of all, I want to say thank you to all of you who have been with us uh, since this morning, uh, and we are so grateful for your testimony today. We're grateful for your feedback, and just know this is just the beginning just the beginning of this process where we want to be able to formalize as we move forward with both the state agencies as well as the federal agencies. We want to say, uh, uh, send a hearty thank you to each of the panelists uh, who have traveled from far and wide to be able to be here today. And I think we need to give our panelists another round of applause, please. There are some folks who helped put together this hearing uh, and uh, we wouldn't be here without them today. Again, the individual to my right in, in particular, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude uh, to, as always, that's Mr. Tom Westlow, the Chief Consultant on Fisheries and Nice job, Tom. I want to say thank you to Carlene Rebish as well as Tay-Tay Morrison and uh, also Thomas Witzel, who is the district representative for Humboldt, Trinity, as well as Del Norte Counties for all of their work. We would not be able to do it without them. We want to say thank you to both Dana and Phil, who are behind the camera. Uh, and if you heard any cussing, that was probably Dana with the camera. So uh, I do want to say uh, thank you so much. And we want to say thank you to Jeremiah and Leroy, uh, who are the Senate sergeants who are here today for all of their work. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, want to leave with a few words. Number one is early. Number two is often. We need to be communicating early about this issue. We need to be communicating often about offshore wind energy. Uh, it, it, we need to, uh, together as a group, get in front of this to be able to formalize the process. And I'd like to be able to end it as I started it. We need to expedite the work of the task force that was created by both the federal and state governments to put meat on the bone, meat on the bone when it comes to the rules and regulations to protect fishing grounds and our coastal environment where turbines would be located. As we know and as we heard, in many cases, turbines would be placed uh, where there are high winds, which also co coincide with upwelled waters. And these waters have high levels of nutrients, which mean there are high levels of food sources sources, which means there are robust fisheries and marine life in the same locations where potential turbines would be located. Uh, there are several follow-ups, including uh, learning from uh, what has happened in the past so that we do not repeat those mistakes in the future, uh, and also learning what has worked in the past so we can replicate those issues in the future here on the North Coast. This is not going to be the last time. This is just the first that we're going to be coming together. And we promise you here in the next 12 months, we'll be having a follow-up hearing uh, as we start working with the regulatory agencies, the environmental organizations, uh, labor, fisheries, as well as the industry to be able to start uh, putting details and uh, firming up the vision of what this will look like here on the North Coast. On behalf of the entire committee, Thank you for joining us. Uh, and if you are into wind, you may also be into cannabis. Uh, and we invite you uh, to our one-stop shop grand opening at 4 o'clock today, uh, where we're going to be opening up uh, the first of its kind uh, one-stop service center that will have five different state agencies all under one roof serving the North Coast. Uh, it's a $3 million investment by the state of California. The ribbon cutting is at 4 o'clock, and we hope that you'll be able to join us so that we make licensing and permitting uh, easier here on the North Coast uh, as well. 4 o'clock uh, there, uh, right where the time standard is. Time standard is on the top floor. State of California will now be on the bottom floor there in downtown Eureka. Without further ado, thank you so much. We are adjourned.